morning. Thank you for giving your time and your talents to not only today, but uh, to R3 in general across the, the state of Nebraska. Uh, my name's Aaron Hirschberger. I'm not uh, the expert by any means, but I'm here to help kind of try to keep this train on track as best as we can. We've got quite a few of the state's experts coming in today. We've got a few national as well that are joining us via Zoom, which we appreciate you guys from across the state and uh, across the nation that are joining us today. Uh, a couple of things just to kind of get everybody on the same page is each speaker when they're up here, we'll have opportunities to take some questions and answers as long as we stay on track. Uh, for those that are on Zoom, be sure to type them in the chat and our very own Hunter will be able to relay those to the presenters and ask those to make sure that everybody's included in this. This is the uh, third of size of these R3 summits here in the state of Nebraska. And we were doing some calculations. We, we came up with at least five others that we had in either formal or informal gatherings, but we really do appreciate it. It's great seeing some of the, the best minds and, and folks of action uh, in person today and joining us on Zoom. So that we are very grateful for giving of that, that time and that three hours. This challenge is as important as ever. It's one I don't know if we'll ever officially get to say mission accomplished or that we're done doing it. I think it's just gonna transform and evolve into places, uh, new areas, new opportunities. And what's cool about being here in Nebraska is that we're usually equipped and uh, led in the direction to not only challenge the envelope, but also to push it and to create new areas and, and find new opportunities that are out there uh, on the landscape, which is great. And I think there's no better way to kick this off than with uh, Mr. Jim Douglas, our director for the agency of the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission, who's been with us for over 47 years by uh, calculation. I had to take off my shoes to get up that high a couple of times. Last year is uh, nine years as the director, uh, and obviously he's been involved with R3 quite a bit over the years. In fact, if you remember, before we even had three R's, we had the RDR plan that came out in 2007. Jim was uh, served as a chair for the steering committee on that. He's been a very vocal uh, proponent for R3 in Nebraska and on the national stage to say the least. And I can't think of any better individual to come on up and, and help set the stage for today's uh, discussions and presentations. Jim. Well, hello everyone, uh, including all of those of you who are Zooming today. You know, hello Zoomer, the, the new hello Boomer. But there's, a, there's certainly a difference because if you're, if the, the distinction between a, a real Boomer and a real Zoomer is whether or not you can set up your own Zoom meeting and be the host and whether you can share your screen. Uh, none of which I do very well. So I'm glad we've got some technical uh, assistance here today. But uh, no matter how you're participating, we're really glad that you are. And, and I have worked for the commission for over 47 years. Uh, so uh, I'm gonna take the privilege of being able to ramble. I'm getting older, so I think I can ramble without any, uh, without any re repercussion. Uh, you know, I, uh, I, grew, I grew up you know, in one of those situations that we that we all sort of look back on and, and envy if you're into thinking about how people get started in hunting or fishing. You know, I grew up in in central Illinois in a in a semi-rural setting, you know, with with parents that, that fished and dad and brothers that hunted and relatives that hunted and I had, you know, uh, woods and creeks and fields, you know right within walking distance of my house. And so, so a lot of times people will say, you know, you were lucky because you, you grew up in that time. And I was, but if you think about it, you know, the same things that we talk about today were, were happening, but it was a, a fortunate collision of circumstances. I had, I had a mentor, I had a mentoring family. Um, we did things as a family. I had access, you know, I could just, walk over and my dad knew the people that owned the woods and you know i could hunt on old man henry's place and uh, i could run our beagle dogs over there i could hunt mushrooms over there i could even catch some small fish over there and so so i had access i had opportunity there was abundant fish and wildlife i had mentoring and uh and the culture was such that you know we ate an awful lot of game so when we try to replicate some of those uh, conditions today, uh, 
that's what we do. You know, we're appealing to some of the millennials who want new experiences and maybe it's because they want to uh, eat some of the game that they, they kill. And when we try to provide mentorship, if it's not occurring uh, within the family, then we, you know, as professionals, we try to find other ways to do that. We try to provide access and, you know, we try to provide uh, opportunity. So, so all those things are still important. And a lot of the things that uh, the Nebraska Game of Parts Commission and, and all of you as partners uh, did back in uh, 2007, when we uh, wrote our first 20 year plan for Hunter Angler, we called it, as Hershey said, recruitment, development, and retention. Uh, but interestingly, as I look back on it, you know, at that time, there was still, there was, you know, it was earlier times, but there was research going on on, on the motivation that, make, that allows or makes people motivated to hunt, fish, and enjoy the outdoors. You know, if you look at our 20-year plan in the introduction uh, that was clear back, done clear back in 2007, you'll see quotes from Duda and uh, a lot of other researchers. Um, and you'll see uh, things about no child left behind and so on and so forth. So the, so the circumstances were different, but uh, the things that we thought we needed to do, a lot of them fit into the same kind of categories. And we came up with 38 different initiatives that we were gonna do uh, back in 2007. Uh, we had to pick the top 15 that we thought were going to be uh, the most beneficial for our purpose. Uh, and concentrated on those because of capacity. You know, the capacity wasn't as, as quite as good in those days. We didn't have as many people trained in some of the things that need, they need to be trained in, in education and in mentoring and so on. And our partners hadn't really um, jumped into the game in the same way they have today. Um, and now we have uh, a lot of additional research and we have national and regional efforts to try to apply the research that we found. And I think it's beneficial. I think we can do things better. Um, you know, I was uh, asked to be on a panel at the uh, National Convention of Wild Turkey Federation a couple of years ago. And the panel was about um, hunting and fishing, uh, mo mostly hunting on that panel, uh, recruitment, retention, and so on and so forth. And there, there were three questions that they sort of gave us that here's what we're gonna be talking about these three questions. Like, um, are we doing enough in this arena? Uh, are, we, are we doing it fast enough? And is it having the uh, effect that we want? And so I happened to be towards the end of like five people. And so, I mean, I'm not, I'm not, uh, denigrating what anybody else said. They said a lot before they got to me. But I said, well, here's my answers. No, no, no. We're not doing enough. We're not doing it fast enough. It's not having the effect that we want. Now, I think that that's, uh, I did that for, uh, to get people's attention. And then I talked about each one of those things because we are doing a lot. And we're doing it better than we did before. Uh, is it fast enough? Depends on if you look at the curves on some of the participation. In some cases, maybe yes, but not in all cases. And um, so I don't want to be discouraging. I want to be encouraging. But I also want people to realize that, you know, we started, we started down the roads that we're still continuing on uh, quite a while ago. We're doing it better. Uh, we're doing more of it. We're learning more. We're being more efficient. But the work is still there, and a lot of it remains to be done. So we're only going to do it well if we continue to do the research, if we continue to develop mentorship, uh, and if we continue to uh, uh, do it as much as we can. And I think we've tried to make it a priority in the Nebraska Game of Parks Commission. But, you know, if you look at the amount of people that we have devoted to it, the amount of budget that we have devoted to it, probably we haven't done enough. Probably we should, we should increase 
the amount of educators that we have, uh, the amount of resources that we put and help uh, other people do research. We are doing more regionally. The Midwest Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies has taken some big steps um, and our partners have taken big steps. University of Nebraska um, finding out a lot of things about our, about our participants that help us. So I don't wanna be a downer, but I do wanna tell you that uh, don't be complacent. You know, I'm not gonna be working for the commission that much longer. And my main message is don't be complacent. Now, we can be excited though about those small victories that we have. You know, the Nebraska Game and Parks Commission have a hunt, take them hunting campaign, a take them fishing campaign, a lot of other campaigns. You know, we've got, we had thousands of new people uh, hunt and fish and go to parks uh, because of the pandemic when they realized how important it was for their quality of life and it was something they could do in the outdoors and enjoy it. And we're building upon that. Uh, in some cases, we're seeing, the, we're seeing the curve stay up. In other cases, it's flattening out. We'll have to see whether we can reactivate some of those new participants. The Take Them Hunting campaign introduced hundreds of thousands of new people to hunting, the same as Take Them Fishing campaign. In both of those campaigns, one of the things that I wanted us to make sure we did is not overemphasize the professional mentorship. In other words, some people don't want to be a mentor. Some people want to be a mentor, even if it means a great commitment and they're going to, every weekend, they're going to be out there helping us and so on and so forth. And we need those people. But then we also need the people that just invite their neighbor to go, invite their kids to go, invite their family or their church fellows to go because still the number one reason why people go hunting and fishing if they aren't regulars is if somebody else asks them to go we still haven't totally i think energized our orange and blue armies all of all of the people that currently hunt all the people that currently fish and our campers we haven't totally energized all of them uh we have thousands, tens of thousands of them. So, so even though we had a few thousand more people ask people to go fishing and a few thousand ask people to go hunting, uh, we have tens of thousands. So the first thing is replace yourself in the activities that you like, whether it's through your family or your friends, and then keep working on it. And do things at the individual level, the professional level, and the group level. And I look forward today, we're going to learn even more good things about how we can do everything bigger, better, faster, better, and more efficiently. Thank you very much. Thank you, Jim. Uh, one of the things it takes to have any effectiveness at a state level is good leadership. And, and we appreciate that we've got some strong leaders here. Uh, obviously, thank you, Jim, for the, the years you've put into the RDR plan and uh, now R3 as we, we embark on a, a new adventure and new evolution of that. But just to all the district, or excuse me, not only district staff that are here and joining us on Zoom, but also the division administrators uh, and some of the folks uh, that are putting this to work uh, in the field, on the front lines that are here today, that's, that's pretty impressive. Uh, now we're going to kind of help set the stage. We've got a lot to cover. We're going to try to stay on track as, as best as, as we can. Uh, and so what we're going to be doing for the next uh, couple of sessions is looking at some of the initiatives, uh, next steps, the access, the research, and all sorts of good things that have been taking place, uh, have taken place, and will be taking place as we move forward uh, in both uh, hunting, recreational shooting, as well as uh, angling. And so I'm going to hand it right over to Mr. Jeff Rawlinson, who is one of the assistant division administrators with communications uh, that's going to hit on the hunting and the recreational shooting side. And I know he's got several folks that he's going to introduce and, and be part of this uh, team effort. Step over. Oh, we got a flag in the way. All right. Come on up, Jeff. All right, thanks Hershey and, and thanks Director Douglas. Appreciate you being here. 
and uh, all your support. Uh, a lot to talk about. And uh, unfortunately, I don't have uh, the time I want. In fact, they said, Jeff, we're going to give you the most time of any speaker, 30 minutes. And I walked away feeling pretty good about that. And then they told me I had to share it with four people. And I didn't feel as good about that uh, after that. But the four people I'm sharing it with, uh, phenomenal. Yeah, and, uh, and so very happy too. But uh, I'm going to cover the recreational hunting and shooting activities. And I'm going to give you an idea of where we're at and uh, some of the new tidbits as to where we're heading. And uh, I'll let you judge for yourselves on some of those areas that you might want to be a part of. So some of those areas that you think you can help or some of those areas that might excite you uh, as we move forward. I don't think anybody is going to say 2020 and, and parts of 2021 were, were uh, great years, uh, kind of kind of uh, rough years for most of, of the world for that matter, uh, certainly for us here. But uh, through adversity, there comes, there comes a strength, there comes opportunities, there comes uh, some gold nuggets. And we certainly saw those here in Nebraska within our hunting and shooting sports uh, programs. Uh, we, we found opportunities and we found opportunities to do some things that we've been needing to do and wanting to do for some time. And that was to move uh, some of our programs uh, to the uh, uh, digital world, to distance learning. Our national R3 plan uh, was very clear that more distance learning, more self-help opportunities were needed. And, uh, and we started doing that on all fronts. You saw that all across the agency, uh, Fish and Wildlife Education Division, the R3 team. You saw that uh, in a number of programs. She Goes Outdoors was kind of born of that era now. Uh, our outreach to women has always been through our Becoming an Outdoors Woman program, a phenomenal program that's got thousands of women out in the outdoors uh, over the last 30 years, celebrating 30 years uh, this year. But there was more needed. We noticed that these ladies were starting in hunting and shooting sports, fishing, camping, all those things. And they were some of the first ones to leave. Now, usually the research tells us that's a lack of social support. She Goes Outdoors is a new program designed specifically addressing that social support on a larger scale uh, partnership with multiple states in the Midwest to address that particular need, providing online uh, training, equipment training for women to get involved in some of the outdoor sports. Uh, that we're talking about here today, uh, online podcasts for ladies to have more social support than ever before. And uh, it's been phenomenal for us. Spring turkey hunting. We saw a huge change, a huge increase in our spring turkey uh, permit sales last year. I know Chris is going to talk about that here shortly, but uh, we have some opportunities there. And uh, we surveyed those turkey hunters because we want to learn a little bit more about them because we saw an incredible increase in new and reactivated turkey hunters. And one thing still sticks with me. There's a lot we could cover, but one thing still sticks with me, and that is the majority of our new and reactivated turkey hunters in 2020 said the same thing. They've been thinking about going turkey hunting for more than two years. It wasn't just a whim. It was something that they were excited about doing for more than two years. That, to me, represents incredible opportunity for us. Hunter education also uh, was a, a concern for us last year. We wanted to make sure the continuity of hunter education was maintained in a year where we couldn't come together. We couldn't have classes and workshops. We went to an online format that we've been utilizing in, in, a, in a lesser format for adults uh, across the board. And we saw an increase from 10,000 certifications, our highest year to date, to 14,000 certifications last year. And I think we're on par for an incredible number of certifications this year as well. As Jim alluded to, and I won't spend a lot of time uh, recovering that, but our take them hunting, take them fishing campaigns, phenomenal. Now, yes, I could say it's phenomenal because we witnessed thousands and thousands of new fishing and hunting opportunities that likely wouldn't have been there if we hadn't helped make it top of mind. But I think what's more phenomenal about those campaigns is it does something that if we don't do it, who will? And that is it, it creates a, a conversation with the public and makes mentoring a, a top of mind conversation. To me, that's pretty darn important and one of the strengths of that, of that effort. We started working with multi-state uh, grants across the Midwest. Uh, directors brought us together and wanted to uh, help organize some of our efforts in the R3 committee for the, the uh, Midwest Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies. Uh, we started working on some of these multi-state grants and we were successful in, in, in achieving several of these. Uh, some really neat programs are going to be started. Some really neat toolkits are going to be available uh, for state fish and wildlife agencies, a mentoring toolkit. Uh, we're going to finally have the type of marketing materials that we really need to promote mentoring, to promote the imagery, to promote the statements that resonate with our hunters and our anglers and our shooters so that we can continue to make that type of conversation top of mind all across, all across the Midwest. 
A hunter's network tool that's being developed as we speak uh, was a multi-state grant. Uh, we realize that a lot of folks are coming to us today, they're adults, and they want to get involved in hunting for a number of different reasons, or shooting, or fishing, and they don't have the opportunities, don't have the mentors uh, to reach out to. And uh, we believe that this new tool, online tool, that will help match mentors and veteran hunters uh, to start uh, will be that type of tool that will help bring those people together. Research showed us in a study last year that the public wants something like this if it's governed by a state fish and wildlife agency that they can then trust that it's being done correctly. We then reached out to the International Hunter Ed Association and they're on board now. In fact, they're almost taking lead on this new project because as soon as this project is complete, we will download 50,000 trained and certified hunters to be mentors immediately into the field when, uh, when people need them. And so we're really excited about where this is gonna uh, take us over the next couple of years. The Midwest is excited and we believe this will bleed over into uh, all states across the country when it's complete. Uh, our small game diversity toolkit, another phenomenal effort because we market uh, hunting opportunities, fishing opportunities, but state fish and wildlife agencies don't always have the research, the tools to more, more adequately reach those people to make sure we have the right imagery, the right statements. And this toolkit is doing just that so that we can better reach people of diversity, people of color uh, and people that don't necessarily look like us, but are saying, hey, I'd like to get involved in those things you guys are doing outdoors and uh, we absolutely want to have that door open. Uh, we started addressing barriers, a number of barriers uh, in, in 2019, 2020 and, and uh, continuing today. Uh, one of those barriers are waterfowl hunters. You know, a decade ago, we had around 2 million waterfowl hunters in the United States. Now we're, we're looking at 1.5 million. Uh, that's a huge concern. And we all know waterfowl hunting can have its own challenges. And of the sur survey research we did, learning that those challenges uh, boil around identifying uh, duck species in the air when the novices are out hunting. Now, many of us started hunting, we had a mentor. We had somebody, probably an old rickety duck blind that had been hunted out of for 20 or 30 years. And we had all kinds of code of ethic to follow when we were uh, invited to be guests on that blind. But think about it this way, you're an adult, you wanna to learn to duck hunt and you don't have that mentor. You don't have any association with that. And now misidentify your duck, you're gonna be in trouble. Well, that's kind of a concern. Uh, Nebraska and South Dakota came together and were able to implement this year for the first time, a two tier harvest system for uh, waterfowl hunting that's gonna, I think, help those novice hunters in a big way. Tier one, just like we always do, you register for HIP and you're able to, with your HIP number and you're able to go out and harvest a, a, a daily bag limit of up to six ducks, no species or uh, with species and uh, typical sex restrictions. If you register for the second tier, now you have a three duck limit. So it reduces your bag limit, but no species or sex restrictions. So identification during the regular duck season because something that you can work on over the season without having to worry about breaking the rules. We think that's gonna have a huge impact. Uh, we started looking at barriers uh, at the regional level, as Jim alluded to, a lot of regional work going on because things that we just can't easily do by ourselves. And, and some of these other barriers I think are worth noting. And, and I'll just start by saying this. I'll just start by saying this. Uh, if I ask the audience here, what are some of those barriers that all of us had to address starting out? What would you tell me? What are some of the barriers you had to address uh, starting out hunting, uh, shooting sports, uh, and getting involved, say duck hunting, deer hunting, doesn't matter. What are some of the, what are some of the obvious ones? Access, got to have a place to go, right? Critical. What else? Gear. Research tells us, yep, gear is an issue. Got to have gear. What else? Equipment. Somebody to show you how. Absolutely right. Somebody to get somebody to get you out in the field and give you those ideas or give you those skill sets. Uh, and, and the list goes on and on. Skills, learning those skill sets, learning how to call, learning how to set up a blind, tree stand, what have you. And and those are all things that are really big, big, big. I don't say barriers, but they're things we have to address. And if you don't address them, they are a barrier. But now add all those up. And then take in some of the additional barriers that we're learning through our focus groups, through our multi-state grant program, and understand people of color or women uh, taking to the field. They have all those barriers, plus they have barriers regarding their safety. Uh, comments resonated many times about going out into the woods in a field dominated by white males with guns. We don't think like that. I don't know anybody in this room that goes opening day. That's, that's a concern, right? But 
other people do. And the list goes on and on. And if we don't address those barriers, or at least recognize that those barriers exist, we're not really extending our hand to those folks. We're just kind of giving it lip service. And we in Nebraska have been starting to address those barriers. I'm very proud of the, some of the things we've done in our agency. But certainly we have a ways to go and certainly nationwide, we have a, a, a huge ways to go to start addressing some of those barriers and or at least recognizing some of those barriers exist and uh, helping them understand how do we address them moving forward. Uh, in Nebraska, uh, some of our uh, media efforts, I think are what I would consider uh, uh, incredible compared to a lot of states across the country. Uh, uh, you, many people have long heard me say, you have got to be a leader in the conversation. And, uh, and that's incredibly true when it comes to hunting, fishing, shooting sports, uh, you know, camping, boating, all of our, our recreational opportunities. The conversations are going on. If you're not going to be there leading them, uh, you may not like where they're going. And uh, we have so much to tell. We have so many incredible stories to tell. We have so many successes to tell. Over the last couple of years, our radio programs, Nebraska Outdoors, the Out Nebraska Statewide Program, many of you in this room have been on those programs. They're focused with the sole purpose of bringing some of the, the heroes within the agency to light so that the public knows what you're doing, how you're doing it, how incredible that is, and how it impacts them. And they've been, they've been very successful in doing that. Our stint with Pure Nebraska on TV and Channel 1011 reaches an audience every week telling them about something important that your Nebraska Game and Parks Commission is working on and, and, and how it impacts them and how important that effort is to them, their families, their communities, their way of life. And of course, we have a number of shows across the state. You know, I would say that it'd be remiss if I didn't say that if there was a model set uh, Greg Wagner in the Omaha, Omaha office, uh, he set quite a model as to how to engage with the public, how to engage with media. And we're seeing that in different areas of the state now, of course, with Julie Geiser in North Platte, uh, Justin Hague in the Panhandle. Uh, by the way, it's Greg Wagner's birthday today, and he's listening right now, so I had to say that. But anyway, uh, we, but we appreciate those efforts. We appreciate bringing the light all the cool things we're doing. But like I said, these efforts the most important element is they bring that conversation to the public. They make sure that the public is hearing that and has a chance to engage with us. Uh, on the shooting range front, uh, I couldn't be more serious when I say this is one of the more phenomenal efforts now and into the future. Uh, hunters, just like wildlife species that our teams have been able to, to bring back from the brink of, of, of destruction and, and uh, uh, despair over the last century. The one thing that was incredibly important with that effort was habitat. And we learn that and we train people uh, to develop that. Our hunters, our shooters, they need habitat as well. Shooting ranges represent probably the pinnacle of some of that habitat. Uh, over the last 18 months, we've developed ranges at archery ranges at Sherman Reservoir, Windmill, Buffalo Bill, uh, Milford, City of Milford. Uh, a new indoor air gun and archery shooting gallery, I think certainly the best in the country, I, probably the best in the world from what, what I've seen at Shadon State Park. We just unveiled it at the 100 year celebration here uh, last month and it was a ton of fun. I left those folks with enough pellets to get them by for the rest of the year. They were out after the first two weeks. Uh, that tells you those, those ranges are getting engaged, public likes them and, uh, and there's more to come. Red Willow's on the, on the books for being developed as soon as we have the bidder. And now we're looking at facilities at Cedar Valley for a new plinking type facility uh, and public shooting facility. And one that I couldn't be more excited about at Buffalo Bill, a Wild West type shooting park. Now, if you think of Buffalo Bill, you have to think of a Wild West show. And I've been talking to historians over the last several months to figure out what this theming is gonna look like. And I couldn't be more excited for people to come out to uh, central and western Nebraska and, uh, and be engaged in some of these facilities and start at Buffalo Bill and learn about the, the uh, Wild West show, the person that was Buffalo Bill and all the cool things that he did, they can do on our range as well. All these things have one thing in common. I can't do them. And so I have to reach out to staff and, and across the state to make these things work. We are blessed. In a time when I hear other R3 folks talking about, yeah, it's tough in my state to get everybody together to, to support some of these things. Uh, I have park staff calling me saying, hey, Jeff, we have an opportunity for an archer range. Come out and look at it. Uh, we, we, we have a, a range need in North Platte, Nebraska, and the staff invites me out. We look at an area and we put something together that we think will serve the shooters and the hunters in the state for years to come. Folks, that's cooperation. That's teamwork. And that's exactly what makes the things like R3 happen. 
Uh, we're going to have more rangers to come with, with our uh, changes in our federal aid here in Nebraska, more things happening on the landscape. Uh, our 75-25 ratio for federal aid to build these projects has now changed to 90-10, meaning we have 10% uh, the cost of the project that we leave on the table, 90% covered through federal aid, and a lot more to come. One thing we noticed is that shooters, recreational shooters, are now making up the bulk of our fish and wild, of our wildlife restoration funds across the country. Uh, an incredible opportunity, incredible partner. And I'll leave you with this. 13 years ago, as Jim alluded, we created the RDR plan. We, 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 we didn't have a lot of research, but we combed through the research uh, quite a bit to develop that plan. Uh, it was very hunting uh, and shooting and, and fishing focused. Today, we're gonna embark on a new plan. This plan is gonna be something the country has never seen before. We're highlighting five different recreational opportunities that we're gonna embark with this plan, hunting, recreational shooting, fishing, camping, and boating. We're assembling a massive team to put this together, help from the outside world to consult, and we're gonna to put together a plan that will have meaningful impacts to Nebraska over the next several years. We couldn't be more excited about that. It doesn't happen without a lot of team support. Uh, and I'm reminded by a comment that our director has said many, many times when it comes to planning. And that is, if you don't have a plan, you're likely to become part of somebody else's plan, and you may not like that plan. <laughs> and uh, folks, we've been leaders in R3 for a good 14, 15 years. Uh, I think we're going to lead the, the nation in another great plan, and I couldn't be more excited about that. Uh, now, any questions before I move on? I'm supposed to wait 37 seconds. I can't take it. Okay. Uh, that said, I've got a, a number of folks who are going to come up here as well. Uh, the first one I'm really excited to introduce because he's been an R3 warrior uh, here in Nebraska with the parks team, uh, helping to get some of these facilities uh, moving on the ground and programs on the ground uh, in parks across the state. Our parks director, uh, Jim Swenson. Jim? Good morning, everybody. Thanks, Jeff, for uh, the introduction, and thanks for hosting this conference with your team. And, and know this, we, we on the park side uh, work great together, and we love working for this agency team that's putting this effort together, and all the partners are involved in, in this very important process. We recognize, and Jeff recognizes uh, and acknowledges that if we view our parks as gateways to the outdoors, we can be successful because we can lure a very, very large audience into those venues that are stretched out across the great state of Nebraska and the great resources that we have in all of those great parks. They're gateways. The first experience a lot of folks have could very well be in a park. It's a lot different, as Jim alluded earlier. You know, I, I benefited from having great mentors, my dad, my grandpa, my uncles, to take me anywhere outdoors I wanted to go, and access was not an issue back in the day. Today, that's not the case. Mentors are fewer and far between. Access is a challenge. That's when the parks can come into focus as those venues that can serve this effort tremendously, serve it very well. When you look at parks uh, as those locations, we can do education there. We can develop outdoor skill sets, as Jeff referenced on the slide with the shooting ranges that we do. We can put those attractors out there that bring that new audience an entry level audience and introduce them to what we do as an agency and as partners together. Access to hunting and fishing is growing in our park venues. Fishing opportunities are great. Dean and his team do a tremendous job of creating new access opportunities. We're expanding hunting opportunities on those venues. They can serve as mentor hunts, hunts. And we've got some representatives from the parks in the room today that have done a great job of that very thing to help carry that R3 message forward. I commend the leadership in this agency for recognizing that parks can be those gateways. We can be those classrooms, those venues for learning and exposure to the great things that we do as an agency outdoors. Great leadership recognize that. It's great to be a part of the R3 plan and our parks team is committed to doing what we can to push it forward. We benefit tremendously from millions of visitors. We, we're not necessarily in the struggle that some, some of our partners in the agency are at this point in time, but we certainly are on board to help and we've got the force that can do it out there to accomplish great things. Again, we're the entry point. We've had many successes, uh, as I've alluded to, 
and uh, there are many, many more to come. Parks are honored to be a part of this program, and uh, the team is, is equipped and ready to do that. I know that Jeff and I, when we sit down together, there's great energy there. We start looking at potential things uh, across the state. And I've been a part of his uh, uh, enjoyment level there when he sees and understands the reward of opening those new shooting facilities on the landscape. That day at Chadron for the centennial, uh, you know, it was a dual celebration, 100 years of our state parks, but also the introduction of a new avenue to get people into the outdoors and entice them into the shooting skill sports, hopefully into, into the hunting venue, and also seeing the fishing activity at that historic pond there. So parks are the venues where we can help utilize this to the greatest uh, potential that we can, and we're here to support all that. Jeff, I thank you and Aaron and the team uh, for everything you do, and I thank the agency team for the support you give us as well. So thanks, and we're looking forward to great things. Thank you, Jim, appreciate it. Uh, next up, we have uh, been blessed to be able to uh, have a position in Nebraska, a hunting and shooting sports recruitment and retention activation coordinator uh, hired with the, Nebraska, the National Wild Turkey Federation. Our new person in this position uh, just started here uh, about a couple of weeks ago. Uh, just got him out of Wisconsin, Hunter Nikolai. Hunter. Good morning, everybody. Uh, thank you, Jeff. As Jeff said, my name is Hunter Nikolai. I am the new recently hired hunting and shooting recruitment, retention and reactivation coordinator for Nebraska. It really is a pleasure to be here among some of the great R3 mines in Nebraska, whether that be with the commission, uh, with a nonprofit conservation organization, and most importantly, as a passionate volunteer. Um, a little bit about me, I, I grew up in Kenosha, Wisconsin, an urban city of about 100,000 smack dab in the middle of Chicago and Milwaukee. Um, we would go up on weekends and for trips to Washington Island, Wisconsin, where my ancestors settled and my dad and brothers and uncles and grandpa would hunt deer, turkey, uh, small game. And I really, uh, really was lucky to, to be able to have that social support. Uh, to get me into hunting and angling, and also have a great opportunity for access, which we all know is a, a big barrier to entry. Um, my passion for hunting and angling uh, took me to the University of Wisconsin, and I'll, I'll pause for some booze there, uh, <laughs> where I studied wildlife ecology. Um, uh, and after that, I went directly to the Wisconsin DNR for the past two years, where I worked as the R3 and Hunter Education Program Assistant. Um, and in that role, I coordinated the state's Learn to Hunt program, which sees about 1,200 to 1,500 participants go through that each year. Um, and then also this past year, I had the honor to serve as the acting hunter education administrator uh, for several months during COVID where Wisconsin, like Nebraska, adjusted uh, their hunter education options to all online. And, and Wisconsin also saw about a 3,000 participant increase in hunter safety certifications this past year. Um, additionally, in that role, I've served on the MAFO R3 committee with Jeff and Aaron Hirschberger, uh, working right alongside them on that Hunter Mentor Network that's getting ready to be launched, as well as many other things. Uh, as you entered today, you might have saw the Midwest R3 newsletter. That newsletter I've been editing for the past two years, uh, which really talks, collaborates all the Midwest states um, and their R3 initiatives and ideas and successes and failures. Um, so if you didn't grab one, feel free to grab one on your way out. I know that'll also be posted to the Nebraska R3 Partners Facebook page in the coming days here, which there will be a link to join that later in the presentation today. But that, that newsletter really has been a, a great success in just sharing ideas and sharing information. Um, as Jeff mentioned, Nebraska has, has been ahead of the game with the RDR plan. And Jeff and I were talking last night uh, about how new R3 is and how how adaptive and, and evolutionary you have to be in the world of R3 because there's constantly new research, new ideas, new successes and failures. And really Nebraska has been right there. There were one word, one word off with the RD, RDR plan, um, the word R3 being coined um, and, and really seeing some of the successes Nebraska has from Wisconsin has, has helped them as well, just sharing information and, and pushing ideas forward that do work. So. I very much so look forward to, to 
to working with all of you. I've met some of you already, whether that be virtually or in person. Uh, I think you all have a lot of great ideas. I, I have some great ideas and I'm ready to, to be a resource to you, whether that be in the commission or as a, a nonprofit partner um, or as a volunteer. So I look forward to it. Thank you all again for having me here today. Um, and I look forward to advancing R3 Nebraska. Thank you. Thanks, Hunter, appreciate it. Anytime you wanna come talk about how Nebraska uh, does something better than Wisconsin, you're more than welcome to have the podium. Uh, next up and finally, uh, Molly, uh, Holly Mosling, uh, who is our R3 uh, person with uh, Pheasants Forever to talk about the Next Steps program, another new effort that's gaining quite a bit of ground here in Nebraska. Holly. Thank you, Jeff. So we're a little bit behind schedule, so I'll go through this a little bit quicker than anticipated, but I'll be around for questions afterwards. So the Next Steps Hunt program has been something that was created and was a dream for our Nebraska State Coordinator, Kelsey Wehrman, and we brought it into fruition over COVID, which is extremely hard to do with a new program, and in its first pilot year, it did extremely well, and we're looking forward to the continued success of this program. So the goals of this program, and I'm not going to go through all of them, but is essentially an extension to our extremely successful program of youth mentor hunts. We have graduated over 15,500 youth here in the state of Nebraska alone through this mentored opportunity. And we have the statistics proving that if they went th just through Hunter's education, we saw them about present 50% of the time in licensed sales once they were old enough. Through a youth mentor hunt, we saw that increase 20 additional percent. So just through a one-time mentored experience, we saw an increase in our license sale by helping those youth obtain their skills in the hunting environment. So we created the Next Steps program as an extension to that. If we give them additional opportunities to network with experienced hunters, have additional hunting experiences so that they could be coached through those skills, and learn through those experiences, we wondered what would happen. And so that's what the Next Steps program is. Um, we do this through a youth mentor who has recently graduated our youth mentor hunt, an adult hunting partner, which is often a family member, but not always the case. It can be a, a neighbor who is really acquainted with the family and would like to coach the youth through the hunting experience and participate with them in the future. And then one of our Pheasants Forever, Quail Forever chapter mentors. So it's a more intimate hunting ses session that has proved to be highly successful through this hunt. And so they get to go on three hunts that are fully funded through a controlled shooting area, through the Nebraska Game and Parks, Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever of Nebraska, and then the controlled shooting areas that we have and their partnership experiences. And then they get to continue networking after their graduation of those hunts. So year one, again, I'm not gonna go through all of this just to save some time, but we had all of our goals met for the program and even some additional ones that we weren't expecting. And again, all of this was through COVID. So this was extremely surprising to have come through, but extremely successful in the same manner. So we saw that 40% of our participants when surveyed said that they felt like they were more experienced and we're better able to go out in the field on their own after providing those experiences. Now, while that seems pretty low, that's for most of the participants that only went through one of the three opportunities. If you remove those youth and go to those who graduated the program, who utilized those three, 100% said they were ready to go in the field by themselves. That's a tremendous success on our account. And we look forward to um, testing this even further. All participants harvested successfully, oftentimes harvested more than once through those experiences. So we saw skills development coming through in some manners. And additionally, Pheasants Forever and Quail Forever had six memberships that came from the Next Steps Hunt program and an additional five that were purchased after the program. So as a nonprofit organization looking to expand our memberships, that's another success for a new pilot program that was just pioneered in the, over the COVID period. 75% also had already told somebody about the program and the remaining 25% hadn't had the opportunity but really wanted to. A huge thank you to those who have participated this past year. We look forward to expanding the program even more. 
things to expect here on the, on the 15th on Sunday, we plan to launch our registration for this next year. And if you're interested in learning more about the program, feel free to reach out to me again. I'll be here after the program tonight, um, or we'll have my contact information listed. And we're looking for controlled shooting areas and shooting ranges that are interested in helping participate and expand this program as we're expecting 150 participants this year. We'll go ahead and skip this slide. Here's some photos from our participants this past year. We do have some Pheasants Forever mentors that are currently here in the audience. So thank you for attending. In addition to, I believe Terry's somewhere here with Oak Creek Shooting Sports is a fantastic sponsor as well. My contact information and we'll go ahead and pass it on back to Aaron to introduce our next speaker. Thank you everyone. All right, a lot of cool things happening in hunting and uh, shooting sports. Uh, we're going to jump right into it so we can stay on track. We got a little buffer in the, the break, so don't uh, skip on us. We've got two tag teaming this one. We've got our very own Larry Pape, who I'm going to hand it over, and then he'll introduce Dave from the uh, National Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation. So, Larry. Thank you, Aaron. Good morning. Um, in regards to, where are we at? All right, in regards to angling R3, I'm gonna, re, I'm gonna address a cross section of resources, activities, ideas, and old and new. Um, I'll give you a few examples of incredible partnerships that have been that we've created, um, including those that have made, been made by the, um, you know, this unfortunate pandemic. We've learned a lot from it, um, unfortunate reality. Um, Who's bought their fishing license this year? Come on, hands up. Well, you're not out of time yet. September's still a good time. In regards to people who haven't bought, they're called lap stanglers. Uh, last year, if you were identified as a potentially lap stangler, you may have received a card, a, uh, an email or a, a postcard that was similar to this. Uh, what's a life likely angler? <clears throat> Well, that's a fishing permit purchaser from the previous year who has yet to purchase one this year, who is unlikely to purchase one in the following year, right? So we did a study in 2019 and toward 2020, where we looked at the lapse likely, likely anglers from 2019, identified them for 2020, and tried to do an incentive for them to come forward and, you know, and buy a permit. The thing is with lapsed likely anglers, if you normally go with your normal protocols, you don't even identify them as lapsed likely until up to 12 months after they've actually lapsed. It's too late to sell them a permit for that year. The problem is trying to figure out from this incredible data set, you know, 200,000 permits, which ones actually are going to be lapsed, right? Well, we could just market to the whole data set, right? Well, that's costly and a lot of wasted effort. Well, through the voodoo of uh, machine learning, Keith Hurley developed a, a concept where we can actually go in using um, the data that we have from anglers um, previously, age, uh, gender, income, buying histories. We can identify those who are most likely to lapse in the following year, correct? Um, he did this on historic data sets and found that at, at over 80% of the historic data, he could accurately identify who those lapsed anglers were going to be. Great marketing scheme, right? So we, we sent out these postcards to those lapsed likely anglers in 2019, and that was 37,000. 38% um, of those actually bumped forward and, and purchased a permit. Some of the things that we actually, um, we know from that experience is that email was more effective than mail. Um, we're anticipating that COVID probably had some effect on that because we sold a lot more permits in 2020 than we did in 2019 or um, subsequent. So there was probably a COVID effect. But irregardless, um, <laughs> but irregardless, what we ended up finding out is that just for those 37,000 that we uh, that we approached, we actually bumped the sales of those people over $13,000. So it is a, a, you know, an absolutely a positive endeavor. Um, diversity is current buzz, right? Um, and we've been working for a long time proudly on, um, on this for several years, uh, recognizing that Nebraska is made up of uh, many different uh, diversity a, a lot, along a lot of different measures. 
We started years ago trying to reach out to our Hispanic neighbors um, through RBFF and the, and the George H. W. Vamase Pescar, uh, George H. W. Bush and Vamase Pescar grant. We, um, we've reached out to uh, Hispanic populations across the state, specifically inviting them and trying to engage them in, in places or into our activities where they felt comfortable actually approaching us and coming to this. Um, we learned a lot of things. Ultimately, one of the things that we learned was translating brochures is helpful for them, but it also creates um, uh, an idea and a, an aura that we are actually inviting to them and we're actually serving that population. So, um, and I've got to attest that some of those culturally events uh, are tasty because there was a lot of sometimes uh, specific food brought to them. And so, um, yeah, the benefits of my job, right? Touchy wheel. Community fishing events, we've been doing those for over 12 years now, actually about 13, 14 years, depending on how you count it. And proudly, I can say that I've introduced thousands and thousands of people to fishing. Uh, we've engaged hundreds of volunteers, uh, reactivated them, keep them re-engaged. And as importantly, um, we've sealed our relationships with partners and organizations. Um, this image, for instance, is from a 2019 Discover Fly Fishing and Family Fishing event at Mormon Island. We had a dozen or show up for the family fishing event, but we also had a couple dozen show up for this initial fly fishing program. It's, uh, it's important on a couple different levels. One, here Kenneth, uh, Kenneth Weisenhut in the foreground is uh, tying flies. He's a partner, strong partner from Cornusker Fly Fishers. And in the background, one of our volunteers, Julianne Carbonell from, Corn uh, from Trout Unlimited uh, demonstrates fly fishing. Um, advanced Discover programs are gonna be a strong emphasis for in the future. Um, we've done advanced, uh, these Discover fly fishing. We've dis done Discover cat fishing. Um, this year we added Discover bow fishing to one of our events in uh, Council Bluffs, or um, I'm sorry, Bellevue. And um, we were encouraged because we got incredible turnout just specifically for that Discover fly fishing. It's important on the levels in that we're approaching, we're getting people to come to those events for that specific endeavor, that next step kind of activity. But we're also engaging groups that discover bow fishing, engage bow fishers of Nebraska, and they came out in strength to help support us, support themselves in that program. So that discover next step process is really important to us. Okay, so the Nebraska R3 Working Group has uh, three different emphasis, and one of the strong emphasis for angling R3 is that of partnerships. Uh, working groups, uh, where we've been working, this group has been working to help identify new partners, create new products through marketing opportunities, and, look, and a list of new potential partners. Um, one of my rock star organizations is the Cornusker Fly Fishers, and they've been doing activities, R3 activities, long before we initiated the idea of RDR or R3. Um, they've been doing, um, for instance, um, the, the fly casting, the fly workshops at Shram Park for years. But in partnership with them, we, you know, we've been able to partner with them and bolster their activities and they've been help, you know, helpful for us. So those are the kind of partnerships that, that uh, through the R3 program and through the emphasis that we can actually uh, uh, create more energy. Um, no ideas are crazy in terms of the different uh, activities that we can generate. Um, Cornusker, I mean, um, Eric Einspar, the, the uh, president of Cornusker Fly Fishers, the current president, teaches an annual class at UNL on fly fishing. Um, Casting for Recovery, another group pictured here. Um, they've been active for years in terms of um, using fly fishing as a point of departure to help support breast cancer survivors. One of the new ones I'm really excited about, and with the support of John Wright, who is a Healing Waters representative for Trout Unlimited, um, we've partnered with them in, in, for instance, our partnership. We did a program at NOEC where we uh, created fly rods or we built fly rods. That's part of their program to support veterans. And we opened it up to the public. So we actually, we had 15 veterans and we had five people from the public and we built some beautiful fly rods and it's that next step outreach. Fly fishing, I'm encouraged because um, what we're seeing is that a lot of the 20, 
to a 40 set are really engaged with that. It's a very aesthetic thing. And, and um, so this fly, whole fly fishing approach is appealing to me in terms of actually generating a new class of anglers, a new energy. COVID um, kind of pitched us fits, right? But fortunately at Game of Parks, we have a really strong team, a very creative team. And last year in May, when I came to realize that I wasn't gonna be doing my programming throughout the summer, um, Jerry Kane from our communications department came to me and asked if maybe we couldn't uh, just knock out some information to bring people back to our resources, our online resources, our web resources. And he came up with the idea of using short 600 word articles that are press release kind of style and putting those out to media sources across the state to see if we could generate a little more interest in terms of just coming back to us. So when he and I wrote uh, seven articles across the summer of 2019, or I'm sorry, 2000 or 2020, and um, put those out to papers, those had the intention of teaching people about our resources, teaching people about our topics, and then guiding them back to our website. Uh, the pickup was incredible throughout the summer. We, we saw well over a couple hundred pickups of local papers throughout. So we, we continued that enthusiasm and went into the fall and used that to promote trout fishing. Whether that actually improved the attendance at our, the places we stock trout in the fall, I'm not sure. But I know we got well over 50 to 100 uh, pickups with the media sources around those areas that we normally wouldn't have gotten exposed. So due to the creativity of Jerry and, and we just took some free time that we had fortunately because of COVID and, um, and we generated a lot of buzz that came back to our resources. And I think we've discovered that, you know, that's a new method in terms of actually creating some buzz and getting, it back, getting our information out and getting things back to us. So, um, one of the things I've known is that I can't stand still and in terms of what we do and how we do it. We were fortunate in that um, we added one more trailer to my fleet of nine in the state. This is uh, the first catch center from the, from the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation. Um, this one, um, I say it's energizing because it's brand new, it's shiny, uh, has a whole new concept a new set of gear that was uh, supplied by Bass Pro and Cabela's, a lot of new partnerships. Um, but I know from experience, we've had trailers for over 20 years. We know the utility of them. We know the importance as billboards, as energizing um, centers. And so this new, uh, this new trailer we've used throughout this past summer um, at programs for in Omaha and Lincoln, our community fishing, as well as the Centennial Park celebrations across the state. Um, I'm encouraged, just in a little FYI, we have nine of these. The original one was uh, built in uh, 99, to, uh, and that's just the workhorse. It's part of our loaner program now um, that fisheries uh, and staff can use to do their programs. Um, the old workhorse we have that was built in 2011 is the family fishing trailer. It holds about 150 rods and reels ready to go. Um, that's the one we use for large events. This is of course the new one the RBFF First Catch Center, um, and it's the one we're going to use to bolster our, our new um, Discover program and all those special programs. We also have six trailers positioned across the state. They're little four by eight trailers that are loaners that uh, volunteers and staff can pick up and then go do their programs. You know, instantly you open up the door and you have 50 rods and reels ready to go. So. So with that, I'm gonna wrap up and get us back on time. I see Aaron knocking on the door back here. Um, and uh, uh, well, any, do we have time for a question or two? A couple of questions. All right, if not, all right. So uh, our next presenter um, I'm proud to introduce, his name is Dave Shanda. He's president um, of the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation. Uh, he's very instrumental in the R3 nationally, but he has been really fantastic for all of us on the state level. We've appreciated grants from him to do everything like the lapsed li angle likely to this first catch trailer. Um, a fantastic organization, an absolutely creative and wonderful gentleman. So with no further ado, I'd like to present Dave Chanda.
person that is often at the forefront of any recruitment and retention efforts. John? Fishing's not for me here. <laughs> Well, thank you for the invitation to chat today about, um, you know, something I'm very passionate about, public access. You know, that was brought up earlier in discussion about the importance of that as one of the main barriers to R3. We all have seen that change over time. Um, today, most of my short discussion here will be primarily about open fields and waters program, uh, increasing access on public lands. So, uh, the 97% stat was thrown out earlier. It's no surprise. Um, one of our, our main areas we can gain access is gonna be on private land in the state. There we go. Um, yeah, so the importance of access obviously can't be underplayed. Um, a, n a number of things, uh, we document this in a number of ways, right? Uh, we talked with hunters. Uh, through our hunter success survey, we document usage of public access sites. Um, Three and five upland hunters utilized uh, public access sites in Nebraska this year. We asked some more specific questions regarding how much time was spent on public access lands. And the, the upland game side of things is, is relatively higher than other species groups, but it's pretty substantial. Um, <clears throat> availability of public lands um, is, is known as one of the main determinants of non-residents coming to Nebraska. So that's something we're promoting through marketing, trying to draw new hunters in. Uh, they gotta have places to go. Uh, we answer hundreds of calls throughout the, throughout the fall and winter. Um, thinking about coming to your state, the very next follow-up question is where do I go? Uh, a number of, of other research projects have also documented the importance, um, importance of access and the barrier it is to hunter participation, both in waterfowl, big game, pretty much any species group, angling, angling is the same way. And in Nebraska, uh, our public land base can be kind of broke out in three categories. One would be our federal properties. Uh, we have uh, some very nice properties throughout the state owned, owned and managed by Forest Service, Fish and Wildlife Service, Corps of Engineers, Park Service. We have our state lands, which include our, our state parks, our WMAs, state historical parks that provide access, shown in green. And then we have conservation partner lands. So this is kind of an emerging, uh, you know, due to the lack of access, there's a number of different partners getting involved. Um, several of them listed up there. This all adds to our, to our land base. But like I said, 97% of Nebraska is privately owned. Uh, these three entities or, or groupings here constitute roughly 914,000 acres throughout the state. When we look at our entire land base, it's, it's pretty minor. Um, not only the, the 97%, when we, look, when we look specifically at areas open to hunting, uh, we're under 2%. So that, that is a substantial barrier, um, <clears throat> barrier to hunt, hunting and fishing. So, in comes our, our open fields and waters program. And so this is our, our primary means to increase access on private lands throughout the state. Uh, this had a precursor program called CRP MAP that was entirely focused on access on CRP lands. In 2009, this program was initiated, the open fields and waters, uh, to, to try to accommodate other types of hunting and fishing opportunities. So we enrolled other habitat types beyond just your typical CRP. Uh, the gist of the program is we provide annual per acre payments uh, to landowners willing to allow walk-in access for hunting, trapping, and or fishing. Uh, payment rates are based on the habitat type and location within the state. And we also provide technical and financial, financial assistance for habitat upgrades. A lot of those historically were tied to CRP management, things like mid-contract management or re-enrollment upgrades. That's an easy... Uh, foot in the door for us to work with producers, but there's obviously other types of habitat upgrades we work on as well. Many different landowner benefits to the program. So obviously uh, increased income on their land. Another big one is liability protection. They're covered through the Nebraska Recreation Liability Act. Um, another big one uh, we found through surveys is that uh, a main driver is that it's walk-in only. 
So many landowners enroll their property just for that purpose. Um, after having issues with folks driving on their property, uh, they don't have to negotiate access, have people knocking on their door. I mean, that used to be the, the name of the game. You stop at a landowner's farm, knock on a door. You know, these are busy guys these, these days. And so trying to track them down is a challenge for hunters. Uh, they're also busy, you know, they're, they're running a business or feeding their family. Um, for some of them, that is an inconvenience. Uh, and, th and then there are still um, some landowners that do, do value providing, providing access to hunters and anglers. Many of them do have a hunting or fishing background. Um, and, and many uh, do like to contribute to uh, maintaining that tradition over time. So in Nebraska, we've had uh, substantial gains in our open fields and waters program over the last five years consistently. Um, here's just some general stats. I'm not going to get into too much. This year, we had over 372,000 acres enrolled, which was at an all-time high. Uh, we have over 500 acres of, of uh, ponds, uh, lakes, different things for fishing access, over 45 miles of stream access as well. So when we, we go back to this map, like we said, uh, roughly 2% open to public access. When we add in this additional, uh, you know, 370,000 acre land base and open fields and waters, this brings our total, you know, and you notice that that's a fairly big jump that's fairly visible on the map and how that fills in a lot of those gaps. Um, we're up to 1.2 million acres. And so it's interesting that a lot of people bring up access as, as one of the primary barriers. Uh, you know, one thing we can say fairly confidently is there's more public access acres in Nebraska today than there ever has been, you know, but access is still challenging on those other private lands, you know, and so we're constantly looking for ways to, to adapt the program um, to, to try to encourage even more uh, access. So uh, we prioritize enrollments in a variety of different ways. Uh, one way is through varying our payment rates. We have to pay typically higher values in the east with higher, higher land values, um, higher rental rates. Um, so we had population rate zone where we provided higher annual payments. In recent years, most of our emphasis has been tied in with our burger and pheasant plan and increasing opportunities within these priorities throughout the state. Uh, the reason I bring these up is, uh, you know, when the program first came about, it was, it was really kind of shotgunned out there. We, we wanted access, we wanted every type of access, we'll take it wherever we can get it. We still have to be very opportunistic, but I think over time with the R3 movement, especially, we're, we're finding more and more, we need to be more strategic. And so, uh, you know, we're taking input from hunters and anglers through various surveys, um, utilizing research we've done with UNL um, to come out with a strategic plan to help guide the future expansion of the program. Uh, and, and be able to adapt the program to changing needs of today's hunters and anglers. So all of these properties enrolled in open fields and waters, as well as the other federal, state, and conservation partner lands are consolidated in our public access atlas, which is one of our agency's largest uh, publications each year. We also have made some, some big, uh, big uh, improvements with several online, ver online versions. Our main one is our interactive atlas map shown here. Um, this provides the user the ability to, to look at aerial imagery, do preseason scouting, click on a site, find individual site details. In this case, even links to the website uh, for the, the specific public land that they were on to find more details. Funding for our program are, is primarily through Pittman-Robertson funds and, and habitat stamp sales. Uh, in 2020, we also were the recipient of a voluntary public access habitat in incentives program grant through, this is authorized under the Farm Bill and um, through NRCS. We uh, obtained a $3 million three-year grant uh, back in 2020 that's helping us expand the program over the next several years. And lastly, we do have uh, various conservation partners that do contribute to the program as well. Direct contribution, uh, some assist with the printing of the Atlas, different things like that. Uh, we also, uh, that would be pr predominantly quail and pheasants forever. Uh, Lower Loop NRD, just in the last year, they're, they're matching our OFW rates throughout the NRD, which is something new. It's kind of neat to see 
a natural resource district engaged at that level, um, showing the interest in, in providing recreational opportunities. And lastly, our, our main partner in this is the, is the private landowner, obviously. Uh, building those relationships is, is core to this program. Um, that being said, you know, we showed a lot of those other entities that provide access. There's, there's many others that are involved. And we always try to uh, acknowledge them in our Atlas publications. But, you know, we have, we have cooperative agreements with many of these organizations to do habitat work, to provide access. Many of them own and manage their own properties, providing access. Uh, there's a lot, of, a lot of different things going on, and we're trying to be innovative and, and expand access where we can throughout the state. So with that, I'll pass it off to Dean. Okay, unlike with some of the hunting opportunities, fishing, we have a lot of different opportunities out there. Uh, access is typically not a problem. We've got a, a lot of areas across the state. We only lack in like a handful of counties where we don't actually have public access for fishing. And those are areas that basically there's no water. So otherwise we're pretty good as far as having access. Um, through a variety of different avenues. However, you know, we have a lot of new anglers coming on, a lot of new constituents. It's not the same group of people that originally started. Um, like Director Douglas was saying earlier, you know, he ran down to the creek. And I was glad to hear him say creek because so many people have that misunderstanding that they're, they're rivers and streams, but there's creeks out there. Um, initially, we looked at things as we need to put in boat ramps. And, you know, this is great if you own a boat, but a lot of people don't. And then, you know, a lot of times those boat anglers, they get upset because they see kids and people out on the docks fishing because it's easy access. Well, it took us a while to figure this out. You know, it's not all about just boats and having access there. People want easy access to a lot of these areas. You know, we've also been incorporated for kayak launches. This is something new. Um, one of the things that the sport fish funds allocate is specific dollars for boating access and it's all boats. So we're able to put forth some effort and, and move the kayakers away from the motorized launches into their own launch sites. It, it eliminates the conflict between the different types of users. And then, you know, about 24 years ago, there were some really sharp guys that come up with an idea about an aquatic habitat stamp to fund additional monies to restore some of these lakes. We're, we're fortunate to have the Sandhill Lakes, the natural lakes, but the majority of our lakes are irrigation reservoirs, flood control reservoirs. Um, they're, they're not designed long-term for fishing or recreation. So some of those had to be redone. And, you know, there's a variety of ways to do these things. And about 2010, we were able to have money specifically allocated for access, angler access out of the aquatic habitat fund. This aquatic habitat fund is something that was new to the country. Uh, we have a number of other states that are trying to model after this program. But with angler access, you have to focus on the different types of users. You have your urban areas, and they may want different aspects to, to their use than somebody fishing a natural lake. So with the urban areas, 
they want it in a park-like setting. They want it family friendly. They want it, you know, they want a restroom nearby. They want all the amenities, the picnic tables, the playground equipment. Most kids have a, a short attention span. So they want to be able to have all those amenities. Some of our state park areas are ideal for this situation where our park users go out and use these and they have fishing opportunities in those areas and it provides that safe environment. We have people with special needs that, or with little kids that want a safe environment. So one of the things we're doing more and more is using fishing piers, easy access, uh, ADA accessible. They're out there to where it feels safe to take the little kid out, get him over water that's deep enough to where he can fish without if he can't cast very far or they can't cast very far, then drop it over the edge and still have an opportunity to catch fish. It's getting the person out there to where they can access, feel comfortable, feel that they're, we're accommodating their needs to improve their environment and their experience. One of the really neat projects, um, this was done out at Johnson uh, Lake at the inlet. If you'd ever been out to Johnson Lake, it was one of these deals where typical inlet on a irrigation reservoir to where, or a power reservoir to where you had rock lined. And if you were really agile and young, fishing there was real easy. But as you got older or not real sure on your feet sometimes, Putting a sidewalk in there was perfect. That area is getting a lot more use, uh, thanks to former commissioners and stuff, uh, encouraging this, uh, the benches, the little fishing pier there. It is so much more user-friendly for seniors, for kids, uh, that it really makes for a good environment for the, the various users. Fort Rob State Park project. This is, an, this is a showcase in my mind of what we can do when we partner with our parks people. Uh, the Grable Ponds out there and some of the other ponds were rehabilitated uh, using aquatic habitat dollars they were deepened. Uh, there was artificial structures put in the lakes to attract fish. There were the fishing piers uh, in this picture. You can also see the kayak launch just next to the fishing pier there. Uh, there's shade. Uh, if you've ever been out there, trees are not overly abundant around some of these areas. Having that extra shade and everything is really beneficial. Um, the use on this area has been tremendous since we've completed this project. We have additional projects scheduled there of rehabilitating uh, Carter P. Johnson Lake and Crazy Horse down below. Uh, also the third Grable Pond, um, we're taking the opportunity to work on that one also. But again, this is a prime example of a project that I think is a real showcase. This is another one in Eastern Nebraska. Conestoga, if you have not been out to the wreck area there and seen this, the result of this aquatic habitat project, it is amazing. When we started off with aquatic habitat projects, we'd drain the lake down, dig them out, put in structure, fill it back up, and then the people would come and it was like, what'd you do? because you don't see anything. With this, we put in so much fishing access in conjunction with the in lake work that it would be hard not to notice the change. I was out there this weekend and there were people in larger boats fishing, there were kayakers, there were people fishing from shore, 
there was a diversity of nationalities using the area. There were campers. It's a fantastic opportunity to take young people out, to mentor people in a safe environment to where it's easy access to deeper water without a lot of vegetation in the way, trees or anything else. And then sometimes you just have to have an area for certain anglers that they wanna get away. They wanna just have a place to where they don't need all the amenities. And the nice thing about our natural sand hill lakes is they provide that opportunity. You don't have to have a fancy boat ramp, a simple boat ramp will work, uh, a parking lot to get in and wade and fish. These things, you have to provide for a variety of people. Oftentimes we'll ask, you know, what do you like to fish for? Well, we've got a lot of different species of fish out there and everybody's got their own opinion as far as what is important on that species of fish, particular species they like to fish for. And, you know, some people may be walleye, some bass, some catfish, some crappie, some bluegill, some northern pike. It varies. So we're trying to provide a wide variety of opportunities for a wide variety of people. You know, not everybody is gonna be happy with every single situation, but I think we provide enough opportunities for different areas to provide a unique opportunity and a safe opportunity to take people out, to take them fishing. And I see Aaron moving towards me. So questions. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, again, a, a big thanks to those that work with access, uh, wildlife management areas, state recreation areas, uh, uh, even the open fields and water. And yep, Dan, I see you back there, the private landowners that allow access for opportunities and, and uh, some of the other partners that we have, which are off, just awesome. You know, when you hear the, uh, the complaint, we need more, it means they like what they have. Uh, and I think we all try to, to work towards getting that, that need met, and it's going to be an ongoing challenge. Before we go to our next uh, agenda item, I got a couple people that snuck in that uh, we didn't see right away. We've got Deputy Director uh, Tim McCoy there in back. Looks like he's taking notes. Thank you. Good to see you. Uh, thanks for being here. We've got uh, Assistant Director Roger Kuhn that snuck in as well. Thanks for the support you guys have given the our three efforts uh, to this point as well, and we look forward to, to more support in the future. That said, uh, we're getting ready to go into a break, but before we do, we've got a few directions for those that are in person. Uh, as we kind of make that shift from some of the things that are going on and kind of a status report to some of the research and into what we're gonna be doing at the regional and district level. Uh, so you can prepare for that. We've got some uh, snacks and beverages there uh, as you exit. For those that are at home, hopefully you've provided your own or got the cupcake in the mail. If not, wait longer, it'll be there. Uh, but uh, we're going to take a, a quick break. Uh, we'll be back here uh, right on the dot at 1140. But we've got uh, some color challenge uh, for you. As you make your way out or back in, for those that are in person, We've got some colored cards right here. And this is vital for one of the big things that we're gonna be doing to wrap up today's summit. Uh, I want everybody here to grab one of the orange ones that says statewide. And then we've got color coded by the four districts here in the state. Uh, one of the colors that matches the district that you work in, represent, uh, or have an impact on. And if you want one of each, I think we've got that as well. But you can see, whoops. Uh, the ladies right back here, Julia and Kayla can help you out. They're even labeled. Uh, so make sure you get the right one. So we'll be right back here at 1140. Right back in uh, on track for uh, the rest of the agenda. So thank you. So oh, there's no, so you can hear me. Awesome. So yeah, unfortunately for Director Douglas, he's not going to be able to hear all the great things that I said about him that all your virtual participants were able to hear. So I guess, Jim, you'll have to go to the videotape. But um, I'm just happy the glitch wasn't on my end. Thank you for a few moments to speak with you. And 
you know, Jim, I wish you well in your pending retirement. It's been my pleasure to have worked with you over all of the, the years that you've served as director, and you've truly been a leader both in R3 and the work that you do on fish and wildlife. So congratulations to you. Um, I'm going to share my screen, and uh, I'll probably turn my video off just to make sure that um, so here at the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation, um, you know, we work closely with a, a whole variety of partners. Um, one of the great things about fishing, though, is we know that uh, fishing participation has continued to grow over the past uh, 20 years or so. We also know from the research that's being done that many anglers are getting older. And if we don't do something about it, as those folks age out of the sport, um, we're going to see a significant decline in participation. So here at the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation, we focus on four what I call focal areas, that being consumer engagement, state engagement, industry engagement, and federal engagement. Um, and, and all I'm going to speak about at a very high level today is consumer engagement and state engagement. And I'll really just touch briefly on the consumer uh, aid engagement uh, section. And most of the consumer engagement centers around our marketing campaign. We do a national campaign. Uh, on behalf of all state fish and wildlife agencies that looking to drive new audiences to, you know, through the, uh, the model that can create an angler. Uh, so we're driving them from awareness to interest to hopefully taking action. Uh, this year's campaign was get on board. Uh, I know the R3 folks in the audience have probably seen our, our PSA, but I'm just going to take a few moments to, to share it with you. Hopefully it plays okay for you. If not, you could uh, visit our website to see it. But this was the uh, PSA that highlighted last year during the COVID pandemic. I'll show you how to unwind. Come on, babe, let's go outside and take the boat up. I'm ready, I don't want to wait. Because the only thing I want is to get out of this place. Come on, babe, let's go outside and take the boat up. I'm ready, I don't want to wait. So that campaign uh, went through all of last year, and it was probably one of the most successful campaigns we've ever had with over 4.3 billion impressions. Uh, and I'm sure COVID played a role with that because people were online looking for uh, things to do, uh, sites to see, and I'm, I'm, I'm absolutely convinced that it helped us. Uh, that's probably twice what we do in a typical year, but it, it really did a great job driving the audience to take interest in fishing, and we think helped move the needle a little bit last year. Now, we have, uh, we track all of our metrics, but one that I think would be interesting for the Nebraska team to recognize is at the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation, we don't sell anything. You know, our whole mission is about helping you grow more participation in the sport. We have millions of visitors to our digital assets, but when they come to our website to learn how to fish or, you know, view some of our videos on how to get started, we also try and help them figure out how to get a license and we drive those people to your website. Last year, we drove more than 2 million referrals to state fish and wildlife agency uh, licensing sections, as well as your boat registration pages. Uh, and of course, we know that last year more people took to the outdoors than ever before. And through surveys of state fish and wildlife agencies, uh, you realized over 3 million additional licenses sold uh, versus 2019. So it was a good year for angling last year. And of course, the challenge for all of us is how do we keep those anglers? And of course, we, all, we do a lot of research at RBFF. We do an annual survey on participation. And uh, 2020 participation in the United States was about 55 million anglers last year. Now, just be aware that in our survey, our anglers, we're, we're counting anglers six and up. So our numbers would not match that of the U.S. Fish and Wildlife Service with their license certification data, um, you know, because most states don't even sell a license until children reach the age of 10 to 14, somewhere thereabouts. But our surveys include anybody six and up, and, and clearly, 2020 was a great year for, for all of us. <clears throat> now, one of the things that was really rewarding was to see where the particip participation was. It was very strong in a lot of key segments that we're all interested in. Uh, youth, uh, women participating in the sport, Hispanics, African-American were all up 
and uh, great numbers to see. And then probably the, the more rewarding thing that we saw in our surveys is that these new anglers skewed more young, the audience was more diverse, and they tended to be uh, from an urban location, which matches up nicely with our mobile first catch center program, which I'll talk about a little bit later. Now, when we surveyed these anglers and the boaters, we, you know, we were asking them what was the likelihood that they were going to continue post-COVID. And, uh, you know, the results were, were staggering. Over 90% of the new anglers indicated that they were likely or very likely to continue fishing. And you saw similar, you know, high numbers with uh, the new boaters that were out there. But like everything, uh, we have to recognize that, you know, people have limited recreational time. You're in competition for that recreational time. And we know that, uh, you know, as things start to open up in all of these states, you know, all of the things that were shut down, whether it's the movie theaters, kids playing soccer, they're all going to be competing for those anglers' time. And it's, you know, really important for the state agencies, you know, to focus their, their efforts on retaining those new anglers and reaching out to them and reminding them of how much fun they had while they were out there fishing. Now, on the state engagement side, which is one of my primary focal areas for uh, the Recreational Boating and Fishing Foundation, we, we work really hard. You know, uh, it's a team of two. Many of you know Stephanie Hussey, but, you know, we're always trying to help states grow the pool of Angler R3 coordinators. And it's just incredible to see the kind of growth we've seen in state agencies over the past five years and their commitment to R3. And that's not easy because it's going to be very challenging for directors like like Jim, when you have uh, fixed funding, you have fixed amount of staff, you know, the fact that we've seen a, a surge in commitment to both staff and resources to R3 means it came from somewhere else in the agency. Uh, and that's why when we try and work with states to develop a state R3 plan, and we are working with your team there in Nebraska, it needs to be an agency-wide plan so that the entire agency recognizes the value and the importance of what we're all doing, and we all play a role in that. And then finally, we also try and work closely with states to help them find ways to develop additional marketing plans. Now, for example, uh, recently, the Northeast Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies, their regional R3 committee submitted for a grant through, uh, it actually was through the, uh, the WISPR dollars uh, to develop a marketing, 100 angler retention strategies, marketing strategies, as well as uh, build their photo library uh, representing a more diverse audience. But because the funding was from the hunting side, that got pulled out of the grant. Uh, and, we, and when we found that out at RBFF, we kicked in $45,000 so that that committee could move forward with it. And they did a really great job. Uh, they're starting to share the results of what they received, but you know, they, they have just a tremendous uh, photo library now that I know has been shared on the national uh, R3 website, you know, as well as now a, a, a plan that has some of the better strategies that they can follow. Uh, in their region. So we are very happy to be a part of that. We also work closely with states by providing what we call R3 program grants. Um, in fact, last year we awarded 14 states, 15 grants totaling over $300,000. We do something similar with our Obama Soft Scar program that's targeting uh, the Hispanic audience. Last year we gave out grants in excess of about over $100,000 to more than a dozen different states for the Obama Soft Scar program. Uh, and, and we really just try and help states move forward, especially on the state grant program, to try new and innovative techniques that they might not have had an opportunity for in the past. And in fact, you know, Nebraska was a recipient of one of those program grants to focus on the work that you're trying to do with retaining the, the new anglers that you had last year. And we were happy to be a part of, you know, supporting that uh, grant so that you might be able to you know, make sure that you don't see a drop off in, in angler participation through the rest of this year. Other ways that we help state agencies is we develop different toolkits, you know, and as out of the research that we've had, we, uh, we work closely to develop a, a retention toolkit that basically makes it almost plug and play for uh, states to just grab the retention messaging that works best, email templates that you can grab onto, infographics, you know, plugins, uh, everything that you need so that you don't have to reinvent the wheel. It's already ready made for you to uh, hit the ground running on your, uh, on your campaigns to keep anglers in there. One of the other areas, and we did this a couple of years ago, COVID shut it down, but we realized there was really no continuing education for R3 practitioners. So we worked with the Council of Advanced Hunting and Shooting Sports. We worked with the Association of Fish and Wildlife Agencies 
and in particular, the Fish and Wildlife Service at their National Conservation Training Center in Shepherdstown, West Virginia. And we developed a four-day training program for R3 practitioners. Um, it's a really great program, covers everything, all the nuts and bolts of what you need to start the program, what are best practices, co covers marketing, you know, how do you evaluate, uh, you know, everything that really these, uh, especially your newer employees, uh, need to understand the best R3 programs you can implement. We're optimistic in speaking with the folks at NCTC that they will allow uh, some programming this fall. So we're actually hopeful that we'll be able to uh, offer the program uh, sometime in maybe October or November. And the one thing I will point out to any of the Nebraska team that works on the angling R3 side of it is RBFF does have funding and we will cover the entire cost of your travel if you're on the angling side of the component uh, to attend this training session at Shepherdstown, West Virginia. Unfortunately, because our funding is sport fish dollars, we can't uh, offer something like that to the hunting and shooting sports side, but we'd be happy to help out on the angling side. And then just lastly, there's two programs I wanted to talk to you about. Uh, Larry pointed out the uh, uh, mobile first catch centers. Uh, this all started with a grant from Cabela's where they provided the gear, RBFF provided the trailer and wrap, and we offered them up to state agencies. I, I wasn't sure I'd even get five partners but we offer these trailers up because based on the research that Mark Duda has done, we know these urban audiences are extremely important. So we pulled together a trailer complete with all of the equipment that you would need to take fishing to where the people are, especially in these urban areas. And uh, we had almost 19 states apply for the programming. Uh, Nebraska was one of the first 10 in what I'll call the pilot program. In the Midwest, Nebraska and Kansas received trailers. Um, and, and, and when we found out that these things were really working well, our only ask of the agencies we gave them to were a couple of things. We asked that you give at least eight programs a year in an urban environment, that you try and track your constituents so you can connect them to a, uh, other fishing opportunities or keep them in the continuum loop that what we need to uh, uh, create an angler and to share those results with us. And then what you do with the trailer the rest of the year is, uh, you know, fits in however best it fits with your R3 programs. The program has been a tremendous success, so much so, so that uh, our CEO, Frank Peterson, came to me and asked, can you get another 10 states involved in the program? And, uh, and we have done just that. We have, uh, you know, what you see listed there is active mobile first catch centers. And we're working with Alabama, Arizona, California, Florida, Illinois, and Wisconsin to bring trailers to their states. And we know that running the program capacity is always a challenge for all of you, but we are seeing some creativity out there. Not every state has parks like Nebraska does. And what, what Arizona is going to do is they're going to take the trailer, uh, which will be branded with their agency information on it, and they're going to train their sister agency, Parks and Parks Agency, to do programming in the Phoenix area, uh, which is, again, one of those areas where you'll be able to serve that underserved demographic. So I'm kind of excited to see how that part of the program works out. Uh, but they're off and running and we look forward to every opportunity we can to expand this mobile catch center concept. And I mean, typically, and it's great to hear Nebraska has so many trailers, but most states, you know, they conduct their programming at what I call those brick and mortar locations. You know, the anglers have to come to you. But with this program, you're able to go anywhere you want. And, and we're really optimistic that it's gonna, you know, continue to grow. Now, the final one I'll talk about, and I see it marries up beautifully with the Mobile First Catch Center program, is uh, pre-COVID, uh, RBFF partnered with the, West, with the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources in the city of Alexandria to bring a program which we've labeled Adopt a Lake. Uh, it could be Adopt a Stream. Uh, it's similar to the highway programs, but the difference is this isn't just about trash removal. Uh, the volunteer partnership, the RBFF is the volunteer that does uh, as many as two or three lake cleanups a year, um, but the West, but the Virginia Department of Wildlife Resources does uh, habitat enhancement that RBFF has funded. Uh, they continue to stock the lake with water, and they work with us uh, to develop fishing education programs there, uh, as well as follow-up programs. And we just conducted our first fishing education program there this spring, as as things have started to open up in the in the Virginia area. Um, now the the uh, Alexandria folks, uh, their commitment to this program was I was going to give them fishing rods and reels and we want them to develop a loaner program. 
Uh, they've had some logistical problems, but uh, haven't been able to bring that home. So the reason I'm even bringing this up to you folks is I have funding to help 20 states take this program on to either adopt a lake or adopt a stream. Uh, that $5,000 per state could be used for equipment uh, that you might need to develop the program or set up a loaner program to work with your partners on habitat enhancement. And, uh, and I'd be happy to talk to the team offline about trying to set something up like that. You know, we, we think it's just a great opportunity for states to get into some of these urban areas. And that's what we're looking for, a stream or a lake that's in an urban environment or close enough to an urban environment that, that those folks can get out to it. Uh, and we think it matches up nicely with all of the relevancy issues that state fish and wildlife agencies have going on. So if you have an interest, you know, on your R3 team, by all means, reach out to me. You know, again, I'm going to be looking for as many as 20 state partners this year, and I have about $5,000 per program that we set up. And with that, I want to thank you folks for, you know, giving me a few moments on your uh, session. I'll be with you for the rest of the day. So if there are questions or answers that I might be able to help you with, I'll be, uh, I'll be happy to do that. So again, thank you. We're going to jump right into uh, uh, some research. We are first and foremost a research uh, scientific organization. And the neat thing about R3 is it's definitely evolved to that point. Instead of just thinking we can add another program to make things happen, we now ask, what can we do? How can we be strategic with the resources that we have? Uh, and it's nice that we have folks uh, here across the state of Nebraska nationally, but also here right here on the Lincoln campus of uh, UNL to help make that happen. So I'm gonna hand it right over to uh, Professor Christopher Chizinski, the biggest name in uh, human dimensions that we have here in Nebraska. All right, you ready, Chris? All right, I am going to skip ahead here pretty quick, pass the wonderful introduction and jump right into the, the meat of things. Um, really trying to talk about the numbers that happened in Nebraska uh, through the pandemic on both the hunting and fishing side. And several speakers already today have kind of hinted at some of the things that, that, that have been seen, not only in Nebraska, but also um, throughout the country. <clears throat> so here, is a graph of the individual users. So these are individual customers in Nebraska since 2015. We've got the years across the bottom. Um, these are the number of individuals buying permits in the state. And I've broken it up between a blue and light blue for resident and non-resident. And one of the things you pretty much see is that 2020, we got a pretty big jump in the number of individual users um, number of individual users um, in 2020. And I highlighted that the yellow, just in case you forgot that 2020 was the year of the, the pandemic there, um, just to keep it fresh in your minds. <clears throat> so break this down a little bit further. Who, who are these people? Or, so I guess quickly, this is a 16% increase from the previous year. So there's a, a pretty sizable increase in the number of people during that, that one year. And if we break this down between the hunting and fishing side, um, we see that really the, the big jump occurred on the, the fishing side. We did see a little bit of an increase on the hunting side. And so about a 21% increase in new um, anglers in 2020 versus about 3% on the hunting side. <clears throat> Here is a kind of breakdown of the different types of users that occurred during that 2020 year. So each little box, and this represents fishing. So each little box represents 1000 anglers. And I termed these active, reactive and recruited. So active were those that had purchased the previous year. You can see that the bulk, which is pretty consistent about 52% of all the people that bought fishing licenses in 2020 had bought them the previous year. I'm gonna skip ahead to the far side recruitment. We see about 27% were brand new anglers. These at least since 2015 had not purchased a, a license yet. So these were, were new anglers. <clears throat> the interesting group here is this in the middle here. And these are the reactivated anglers. So these were anglers that at least lagged one year. They could have lagged up to five years, but they lagged at least one year during um, the past couple years, but they had purchased one in Nebraska before. And these are residents only, by the way. Yeah. Great. 
right there. <laughs> so here are the couple years before that. Um, so in a typical year, we have about 62 to 64 percent of the people are in the fishing side are buying them every year or approximately every year. The recruitment is why I skipped to that next. It fell within the range of some of the previous years. So we've got between 22 and 29 percent of brand new anglers popping in every year. The big jump we see here are in the reactivated group, right? You can see that generally the range for the past three years before this was eight to 16% of reactivated anglers. We jumped up to 21% there. So this really shows that a lot of the new anglers that came in during 2020 were people that had been thinking about fishing um, and then finally got the opportunity to come and, and fish that year. Not necessarily just brand new people. These are not new people that, that came, well, they could be, but they're not the, uh, definitely new people because it fell within the range of previous years. So of these re uh, reactivated people, there was 20% were female. This is less than the general population. So the general population of anglers is about 24% um, female anglers. <clears throat> They were slightly younger than the general population. So these, this reactivated group was about approximately 42 years old. The average angler in Nebraska during 2020 was 44, so slightly younger. Um, the interesting thing though, is that they had on average lapsed almost three years there. So if we took all those new reactivate or all those activated anglers that came in, most of them had not purchased a license in about three years. So something occurred during the pandemic to really inspire them to, to come out and go, go fishing. Um, some of the recruited, 26% female. This is more than the general population. So the, the new recruited anglers that came in during 2020 were more female than the population. Um, they're approximately 34 years old. So younger than that reactivated population and younger than the, the general population. Now here are the hunters. <clears throat> so hunters, we tend to see less churn. So that this active group here on the left is, quite, is generally a, a higher number. People that hunt tend to buy hunting licenses every year, which not what we see in uh, anglers. We saw about 14% of those people that bought licenses in 2020 were recruited, or no, 14% were recruited and the reactivated was 12%. And very similar to what we saw in the fishing side. Oops. So the, the typical range of active is 78 to 79%, um, 12 to 16% of for recruited. And once again, we saw a jump in the number of reactivated hunters in this case, mirroring what we saw in the um, fishing side. So the reactivated hunters were about 14% female. So this is more than the general population, which is about 8% of Nebraska hunters are female. So a, a large jump in reactivated females coming in. Um, 41 years old, so just slightly younger than the general population, about 44 years old. And on average, they had lapsed 2.8 years. So in almost three years again, that they had not bought any sort of hunting license over the, the past 2.8 years. The recruited, 24% um, female, more than the general population again. So a lot of women coming into um, hunting in Nebraska in 2020, which has been mirrored by some of the other presentations we've heard. Um, approximately 40 years old, so four years younger than the general population. These, these new recruited hunters are um, more female and younger in generally. So this gave us the, the numbers of who came in, but we don't necessarily know the whys, right? So we've spent the, the past year uh, working with Game and Parks and my lab to kind of get at some of these whys. And we've sent out several different surveys, um, trying to ask some of these different questions. And the thing that we keep seeing over and over again is that most individuals point to the typical reasons to hunt and fish, right? These are spending time outside, um, socializing, getting to know people, and then connecting with nature. All three of those things 
were the, are the top reasons that people came out are, are these reactivated and recruited hunters and anglers were the reasons why they came out right it did not include the pandemic so very little the pandemic made me do it um, to come into hunt and fish which is a good thing right this means that um we don't need more pandemics to bring more hunters and anglers in right if we can go and and tone our message to appeal to those things like spending time outdoors, socializing, connecting with nature. This may help spur some more people to come in um, and, and continue to hunt and fish and lapse a little less than they normally do. And then so some of the further stuff that we're working on, we're gonna to continue to monitor the license sales. Um, and then one of the important questions is, do reactivated stay reactivated? Right? Are we going to see these people now drop back out that had recently um, become reactivated or are they gonna stay engaged and keep hunting and fishing um, in, the, in the future years? And then continue investigation into how we can reactivate some of those lapsed hunters. So I'd keep identifying some of the, the motivations and those things that really got people out um, hunting and fishing in 2020. And I know Matt has been working on a bunch of projects that are targeting just, just that stuff. So with that, I don't know if I got us back on time at all, but uh, any questions? If not, find me later. Oh, Natalie. Yeah, that's a good question. So. Natalie asked, how do multi-year permits fit into these numbers? And I didn't uh, take into account. So if you bought a license, you get captured each year there. So those people are, are, are captured. I didn't break it down into individual licenses or any of those kind of things. Just looked at general users and whether they purchased a license, but good question. Yep. Any others? All right, Rashid. Thank you. All right, we got to switch this over. All right, I've got to make some switches. Um, obviously, one thing that that uh, I want to emphasize again is that there are three R's, and retention at times is just as important as some of the others out there. We oftentimes get lost in the idea that we have to recruit, recruit, recruit. As you can see, sometimes after an opportunity like 2020 came along, retention and uh, keeping people reactivated uh, is also just as important. All right, back on schedule, our next piece has to do with our tenants of the North American model, and that's opportunity for all. Uh, and uh, this agency has re-emphasized something that's been strong uh, within our group and across our state for some time, and that is uh, pushing that forward, opportunity for all. We uh, created a committee for diversity and inclusion, and so we're going to kind of talk about that and its connection to R3. We've got Lindsay Rogers, who is our division administrator for our relatively new Fish and Wildlife Education Division, who also leads the uh, committee on DNI. So, Lindsay? I'm here. Oh, she's I'm behind here. me. I'm right here. Uh, good, good afternoon. Uh, like you said, my name is Lindsay Rogers with our Fish and Wildlife Education Division. Um, so today I'm going to talk about an initiative that we got started on like a, a little over a year ago. And this was what we called the community survey. At first we started calling it our demographic survey, but really it was more than that. We wanted to talk about more than that. So um, the commission adopted our focus on education strategic plan in January of 2020. So right before the world ended. And um, during the pandemic, we really started looking at the immediate recommendations of this focus on education strategic plan. And one of the biggest things that we needed to do is figure out what our diverse constituents needed and wanted out of the commission when it came to our education efforts. So we designed this survey to reach broad audiences. We designed it to obviously look at our education related things, but we also talked about communication preferences. So how do they want to be reached or how do they want to learn about things from the commission? Because that's just as much to do with education as it is to do with access. Um, demographics, we looked at all different kinds of things. We translated this, the, um, the survey into Spanish, Vietnamese, and Mandarin trainees in an effort to try and reach diverse audiences. 
And uh, we connect, conducted this survey from February through late April. So really the last week in February through April. So about a seven, excuse me, a nine week, we had the, the window open. We got a total of about 2,300 respondents. Before I go on and start looking at um, some of the different things, I need to say two things. One, I'm not a statistician at all, like not at all. I can talk to you about state standards. I can talk to you about education principles, but this is just my initial grasping of the data. Um, that's the other point I wanted to make is I'm just starting to really dive into this data. And so um, I wanted to provide some update to you guys of what we're seeing, some of the trends we're seeing and, and some of the data that was provided, but please don't be too harsh on me because I am not a statistician. So kind of looking at who were these respondents, um, overwhelmingly they were white. We had a lo fairly low black um, participation in the survey that said we, we tried really hard. We did a lot of paid advertising. We did a lot of emails, direct emails to individuals working with different communities. Um, and then we had um, a, actually a decent Latin population um, responding to the survey and, and really comparing Nebraska's overall population to the survey population and the demographics of the overall state were slightly low on Latin, but not terribly low on that. Um, the age range for this survey, definitely a little bit lower on the 19 to 24 year olds. Um, and then we peaked out actually at 65 plus. Um, so I think there's a lot of follow-up that we need to be doing with this survey to really get a little bit more information from that younger audience of where we need to be heading in the future. Um, not quite 50-50 male to female, but not terrible. And then um, rural to urban. And I should notice that when I broke things down rural to urban, we asked what county you lived in. And so we based this off of county and I based urban counties on those with a population center over 30,000. The USDA uses 50,000, but I went with 30,000 um, to be able to include the Buffalo County um, with Kearney in there. So Buffalo, Douglas Hall, Lancaster, Sarpy County. So those were all included in the urban area. So let's start talking about, oh, and real quick, I do wanna mention when Gaiman Parks talks about diversity, we look at this from an incredibly broad standpoint. We are not just looking at this from a racial standpoint. We look at diversity from a racial standpoint, gender, sexual orientation, age, geographic. We are looking at diversity from a broad perspective because I think that's how we're gonna best serve all of our constituents. So program interests. Um, it's pretty interesting. Um, there's some slight variation based off of race, but really not a lot right? Um, when we start looking at things, we asked about archery, camping and camp cooking. We looked at conservation of natural resources, cultural resources, hiking, hunting, um, hunting and shooting sports, fishing. We looked at things like um, canoeing and kayaking, nature photography, watchable wildlife. So we asked about a, a broad perspective of things. Participants were also allowed to answer what they, you know, fill in the um, uh, open text box, but um, you can see there's there's really not a whole lot of variation. People are interested in a lot of different things. When we look at age, there's some what I would call logical declines. So when we look at archery, camping, hunting, those decline with age. I don't think that's terribly shocking. Um, but other than that, when we look at just one age bracket, for example, the 19 to 24 year olds, it's it's really right around that 50% mark for most every one of the um, any one of the topic. Um, when we start looking at females and males, the females typically speaking are, first of all, I should say, both males and females are interested in, in lots of different things. And um, we can't just say one thing is male dominated and one's female dominated. But as a general trend, we saw females that were more interested in conservation of natural resources, uh, wildflowers, wildlife viewing, nature photography, natural resources or live animals. And then we saw an uptick in males being interested more in fishing and hunting. Um, I can't say that I'm terribly shocked with that, those results. So when we look at program types, so we're looking at education and we want to know, okay, do you want in-person programming? Do you want online programming? Or do you want self-guided programming? And I don't think we would have asked this question and needed such like really been interested in these results had it not been for COVID and the drastic increase in 
uh, virtual or online program that we saw and, and the huge success we saw with those programming over the past um, 12, 18 months. So overwhelmingly, regardless of your race, overwhelmingly, um, well, I can't say that, but for the most part, overwhelmingly um, in-person was most popular. And that's good because we know that in-person programming has a huge impact on individuals. We will see um, that there is not a whole lot of difference between um, uh, online and self-guided, but it's there a little bit. When we look at age, again, it doesn't matter what age you are, it's overwhelmingly in-person is most popular. And when we look at gender, um, it is again, overwhelmingly in-person. So as much as we will continue to do online programming and as much as we have had success in switching things to online, I don't think that we can do only online. We need to get back to, and we need to continue to do in-person programming. Um, when we looked at rural to urban, you know, it's interesting because I thought maybe rural communities would prefer online because of ease of access. But the truth is, is that they are still um, preferring um, uh, online, or excuse me, they're still preferring in person, but the variation between um, in person and online is, is slightly decreased. Um, let's see, contact preference. So how do you want to find out about stuff? How do you want to know what's going on? Overwhelmingly, email and Facebook. That's how people want to find out about things. Um, yeah, when we look from a racial perspective, there's not a lot of difference when it comes to um, Twitter, Instagram, and Snapchat. It is overwhelmingly um, email and Facebook. When we look at things based on age, here's where we start to see slight variations. And, and if you talk to anybody in a marketing or a communication standpoint, this shouldn't be shocking. We see an uptick in Instagram for the younger audiences. And by the time you get down to 65, Instagram is barely registering. And in fact, um, Snapchat is not even registering um, from the 65 plus community. So um, yeah, we're increasing it. And I can say from an education standpoint in our team, when we are looking at what resources we are putting into an online setting or in a social media setting, we are looking at different things to put on Snapchat or we're looking in TikTok and what do we do with TikTok and what audiences are we trying to reach with these? And so it, the content needs to be different for what you put on these different venues. But as far as letting individuals know about what education programming we have out there, how do they wanna be contacted? It's overwhelmingly email and Facebook. The same can be said for um, uh, your gender. Again, email, Facebook are most popular. And when we look to rural and urban, um, the same thing. There's slightly lower email in a rural setting, but it's interesting, uh, newspapers and radio are slightly higher in the rural setting. But again, that doesn't terribly shock me. The last thing I wanna go over is I slipped in a quick little question of how important is conservation education? So the question was on a scale of one to 10 with 10 being highly important, how important do you think it is for people to learn about nature, outdoor recreation and historical interpretation? When we look at from a racial perspective, there's really not a big difference. We are looking at basically eight to 9.5%. So really not a big difference. When we look from an age perspective, again, there's not a big difference. And when we look from a, a, gender, um, identif a gender identity, there's not a big difference nor is there for rural versus urban. The thing that I want to point out here, though, is, is that the average of everybody that responded to this survey was 8.8. .8. So on a scale of 1 to 10, 8.8 .8 is the average number. That's high. That's great. This is where we need to be, and clearly Nebraskans are desiring to have outdoor recreation education, nature education, and cultural and historical education. That is what we are finding out from these surveys. Like I said, um, A, I'm not a statistician, and B, we're just diving into this research. Um, so look for more coming soon. Any questions? Yes. 
Yeah. So self-guided would be at a location, but um, not having a staff person guide you. So for example, there might be a pamphlet that you take and go to different stations, or it might be something where you go to a nature center and you self-guide yourself through the nature center, but there is not a direct person that is um, guiding you. If self-guided is done online, it would be something where you go at your own pace online versus online with a webinar or online with um, like a direct contact with the, the person leading it. There's somebody leading it. Did that answer your question? Okay. Um, I, I didn't set any expectations, so they were great. The expectations were right on the mark is really what I'm saying. I don't, I didn't know, I, you know, we'd never done something like this before. We didn't pay for it. I mean, we had a survey monkey account and we paid for a little bit of Facebook advertising, but other than that, we didn't pay for it. This was literally me sitting, emailing people, calling people, trying to get the word out as much as we could. So from that perspective, I had no idea what to expect. I don't pretend to know. There's a hundred reasons why, and I don't pretend to know why people choose not to answer. But I think as we go forward in doing this type of survey, that's gonna be, you, you have to count those people, right? Because their opinion counts. And although that means that we can't tie them to a specific race or a specific identified gender or a specific age group, we still want their data. We still want to hear from our constituents. And um, I think that surveys going forward are increasingly going to be having a higher percentage of people that just don't wanna answer that. Um, but we still wanted to be able to look at their, their information. What, what do these people want regardless if they don't want us to tell us? So, yeah. I'm getting the evil eye back here. So, um, so yeah, with that, thank you guys. Thank you, Lindsay. By the way, I just got an Insta snap question for you. Lindsay, where'd you go? Is it truly your birthday today? <laughs> I, I take that as a, a no comment. All right, we'll leave it at that. All right. Now the part that I've really been kind of looking forward to, we could have a jam session, uh, which has got me excited. So hopefully you guys brought your guitars, some drums, that type of things. Uh, we're actually gonna kind of take a peek at something. R3 at not just the statewide level, but at a regional level. And we're gonna try to use some technology as well. So those that are in-house, if you look over at this whiteboard over here, you might be able to use your tablet, uh, your laptop, if you have one of those, it might work on smartphones as well, I'm not sure. Um, for those on Zoom, hopefully you've got the link and the directions how to get there. You'll probably have an easier time doing that. This is where you're gonna need your colorful pieces of paper and a writing utensil. With that said, I'm gonna hand it over to the leader for this uh, closing session. And one of the, one, like I said, I'm most excited about uh, our outdoor education specialist, Julia Plugi. Thanks, Aaron. So like Aaron said, you should have these available hard copies of them if you're in the room. And then those of you on Zoom, I did post the link, I think about the time that Lindsay was starting to speak, didn't mean to do that, but I uh, click that link and that will pull up and maybe we would be able to pull it up here as well, just so that we know. I'll explain what we're doing while they assist me. So following the summit today, what our efforts are going to be is we're going to have some discussion with administration, district staff, and our partners and start collaborating, pulling in the information that we've used today and reach out to, to all of you across the state and start bringing this information in. How, what needs do we still have? Uh, what inform, we've had today some amazing presentations on these efforts that have been happening, but we don't wanna stop here. Um, we know that, I mean, if it's like me, I've been thinking this whole time, what additional information or what things that we can continue to expand, improve, uh, and know that you out there statewide have other efforts as well, or per perhaps questions. So 
what our plan is, is we're gonna set up these regional meetings and they're gonna be in the Northeast, Northwest, Southwest, Southeast districts, uh, split up into the four sections as you kind of see in the map there in the corner. Uh, if, you're un if you're not real sure which corner you work in, just pick one, <laughs> pick the closest one that you suggest. Or perhaps you feel that what I have to say is a statewide, awesome. So, you know, the purpose of this activity that we're going to do now is we're engaging you, the staff, our partners, and we want to hear from you. Uh, we want to learn about uh, what exists out there now that we're not aware of and what projects that we want to uh, pursue in the future. So what we're going to do, and bear with me since we have two different uh, ways of going about this, is thank you, whoever started to put these up. Those of you in, in, in house here, rather than having you jump on the, the electronic jam board, you can write your ideas on the piece of paper. So we have orange or hunter orange. Uh, so if, if it's a statewide idea that you want to, to put on there. So what are the needs, are our three needs for this? Uh, like for example, on my statewide effort here is I need, or we need more female mentors. So what we would do is we would, we're going to write that down if you're in house on an orange piece of paper, uh, some amazing people in the room are gonna go around and collect these, they're gonna pick them up. And then we have a team over here that's going to write them and put them on the Jamboard with the sticky notes. Those of you that are on Zoom, and if you're not familiar with Zoom, this feature right here, right? I think I'm used to clicking. Uh, you can click that, it will pull it up. And then you select the color that represents your district, and you will write in there what you want to add. You can drop that sticky note in, and then a team here in the room with us will move that and continue to add it in. Uh, then you'll see that we'll probably end up having to still kind of dump them on top of each other. What the plan is after that is we're going to organize these efforts. We're going to put them together uh, so it's easier to read. And then we will start scheduling these regional meetings. Uh, we're looking at, I believe, winter time, if I remember correctly, uh, starting to put these together. So any questions on that? So like I said, orange is statewide. So in an effort that you have statewide, blue is Southwest. So an example for that is shooting range at Cedar Valley, WMA and North Platte. That would be an effort there. You don't have to write really big like me. I got teacher writing here. I write big all the time. Uh, you can write multiple responses on one piece of paper and, and turn those in. Green is Northwest district. And then we have the pink is the Southeast district. So what's the end all for all this, for our regional discussions here? So it's all critical as we launch and development of the new R3 plan in Nebraska. You know, that's, that's where we're moving forward toward. We had this discussion today, we've seen what's happening now, but what's going to happen in the future and where do we wanna go? Thank you for those, as you start adding those, like I said, those of you either in the room, if you have access to this Jamboard, go ahead and you can either put them in here or you can write them on a piece of paper. What I'll do is uh, once you have your piece of paper, raise them in the air and then we have a team that's gonna go around, pick them up and then we will enter them in for you. Uh, you, don't have to, you don't have to jam with us here if you're in the, in the building. So what we have so far is uh, find more people who are willing to volunteer, and that is in the Northeast section. But Northeast section's rocking it. So, uh, you know, I don't know. We better get some more uh, assistance in these other district here. Uh, youth mentored hunts in the Western half of the district. More shooting sports events. Uh, in the Northwest, multiple language informational kiosks on fishing, boating, and parks regs at Lake McConaughey. Great. Uh, the Southwest outdoor archery ranges. Oh boy. In the Southeast district, there are, we have more hunting access. 
in Omaha and Lincoln area. There we go. Now we're getting some orange, hunter orange colors in. More marina access and boating reservoirs. Shoreline ADA fishing access on large reservoirs. Great. Shoreline ADA fishing access on all, uh, large reservoirs. And as you can see, there definitely is, uh, they may be in multiple districts, maybe not statewide, but it could represent more than one district area as they are speaking on the reservoirs here. Expanded hunt and fish opportunities in our parks. Now's when I need that like go-go gadget. Anyone have questions or want to raise your hand and, and say them out loud? If you are on the Zoom, if you're a Zoomer and you want to type it in the chat, you certainly can do that. Uh, you don't have to plug it into here. I'm gonna... I know, right? I mean, Definitely, definitely a lot of input here. This is great. We'll be excited to, to put this all together and talk at the regionals. You know, if you're not even in that Northwest area and you're familiar with that Northwest area, add some input there, what you feel that if, whether you um, are staff and you work that area once in a while, or perhaps you are even a visitor as a vacationer, or you go hunting or fishing in that area, perhaps you could add some support there. Oh, there we go. Somewhat more upland game access in the panhandle. Now this is starting to look like my desk with all the sticky notes. As you want to look over there, it's full of sticky notes. This is great. Right on top there, school programming, get more access, uh, outdoor opportunities for fishing and wildlife viewing and hunting. Great. Yes, yes, yes. Perhaps there's even some stuff that you've been doing already that we that uh, our great speakers today didn't mention. Drop that in on there. <laughs> wave them, wave them. Kevin's like trying to get your attention there. There you go. <laughs> This could come off. We'll have a lot of fun putting this together. And like I said, we uh, it may be getting to a bit point where it's challenging to read right now. It's like the game where you have to click the, the boxes and then they, but uh, we definitely will put a lot of time into organizing this and sharing it with everyone. Yes. Oh, yes. Yes. Uh, not completely. Oh, an outdoor expo in the panhandle. And that got put to the top. Hmm. <laughs> um, I can only see like this corner right here. That's all I can see. Is it a more nature and interpretive program in the state parks. Nice. 
I can still can only see that corner. It's amazing. Is there anything I can do? Yes. Oh, look. Okay. <laughs> I'll check. Okay. There we go. I can get it. Well, I changed. Now I don't know what I did. It was at fit sixty five, wasn't it? Back. Yeah. Oh, there we go. I can move it around like that. That's fine. It just disappeared. I need more sheet. Why is it? Let me try to send it back over to you. Okay. There you go. Now I can see it. Thank you. Are uh, more trappers education classes in the statewide? Another sighting range in Omaha. Uh, separate division Facebook pages for public output and knowledge. Okay. More engagement in the smaller communities. Nice, thank you for that. More kayaking ramps. Support and develop 4-H Western Heritage projects to the into school history lessons as well as move the visitors at historical parks to shooting activities. These are getting to be some um, creative ideas. Wow, look at all this. Work with industry to make introduction into hunting and fishing more affordable. Non-powered craft launch facilities and water trails. More path pro properties. More access to volunteers. Promote and establish baseline connect connection to nature, increase ecological literacy as a foundation to recruit new anglers and hunters. Nice. Property tax incentives to landowners for access. In STEM, in school programs tying to STEM lessons. Man, you guys are like rocking this. Oh, my eyes are. Whew. Uh, more companies information in for winter hunts. YouTube videos, series on how to do basic outdoor activities. Nice. Is Lindsay still here? Do we lose her? I was curious if the YouTube was self on that series, if that was self-taught. I bet it was. Did she? Okay. Find recruit mentors of different ethnic backgrounds, trapping courses. It's like the popcorn when it's just stopping to pop and it's starting to slowly slow down. And don't start, you don't want to burn it up. Don't burn it up. Marketing companies that look more like me, not old white guys that have been doing this for 40 plus years. 
I found that when I read it really well. Welcoming messages for new people or women. My young eyes can see that one well. <laughs> Ability to engage new and non-traditional users in Lincoln and Omaha. <laughs> A new Dick Turpin. Who? Just kidding. Just kidding. Just kidding. Give temps access to more agency training. The temps will be the next permanence and and it got right on. There we go. And we'll continue engaging with the public. Nice. A push for more hunter and education gun safety courses in the school systems. Jackson, did you write that one? I feel like maybe we should just had a single page for uh, statewide, which is amazing. <laughs> More and better hands on hands on use of firearms create an understanding of history, function, and abilities. Oh, look at this one. We have a lot of adopt a highways, so promote adopt a pond lake, especially in schools. A wildlife there. Oh, I better not read the rest of that one. <laughs> Boat ramp launching training. And I would like to put on there is boat trailer backing. We have, it's like one of the very popular activities for uh, BOW. There you go, thank you. And camper, I should put the word camper trail on that one. More fishing habitat projects that enhance shoreline fishing for panfish. List of landowners who allow access, or if someone from a different area draws a permit tag, they aren't having to pass up opportunity. I like how that green's like right on the orange, so I can see it. More fishing habitat projects. Oh, I read that. Sorry. Oh, bow chat or BOW or bow chapter developments. I'm gonna put that as BOW, becoming an outdoor woman chapter developments. All right, here we go. Gain partnership with industries such as REI and Bass Pro to provide outdoor programming. A shooting range coordinator position. I think I know where that came from. Ease of getting involved with those new mentor programs. Nice. All right. I think the popcorn machine might have been unplugged, but it's going to be turned back on. So don't stop there. I will keep this live. Definitely, it's going to stay live. I. Uh, as you're driving back to the office, you're sitting in the office, or those of you zoom in, if something comes to mind, keep popping them in there. You certainly can change the, I think you can change the page too and start adding those, or you can uh, add it, you can send it my my way or anyone's way and we can add this together. And like I said, we're gonna, we're gonna put this in a easier to read document 
start splitting up those districts, having those meetings and the discussion, you know, speak with administration on that and move forward and, and start putting together this uh, R3 plan for a state in Nebraska. And Aaron's not up here waiting for me. All right, we suggest that you not drive and do this. All right, so wait till you get back to the to the office and, and add to it. So uh, good stuff. That's going to be something that we review once we get back and go through all those sticky notes uh, to see where there's some uh, duplication and see what came up more than once, obviously. But that was, that was kind of neat to see that being populated up there. All right, we are back on time, which is great to see. Uh, we just got to put our final bow on the, the whole day here because... It's not about just coming to this summit. It's what we do from day to day uh, with our partners, with uh, the public, with our agency, uh, and it's how we move forward. This is uh, just as much a call to action as it is just kind of a, an update on the, uh, the state of R3 here in the state of Nebraska. Uh, I just want to personally say thank you again for coming either in person or joining us on Zoom uh, and spending part of your day with us. This is something that uh, regardless, especially if you work for our agency or some of our partner organizations that are here today, uh, this is something that we work with every day, whether or not you realize it's in the duties, every interaction you have, every action you make, everything that you do out there has an impact on these areas within uh, the outdoor community. But to kind of help wrap it up and uh, give us some marching orders, we're gonna bring Jeff Ronson back up here to kind of give us uh, the, the final thoughts. Uh, thanks, Hershey. Real quick, how about a round of applause for Hershey being our MC today? Excellent job. Excellent job. Appreciate, appreciate it, Hershey. Uh, I've just got a few words, and then I'm going to ask Director Douglas to come here and give us some closing thoughts. Uh, I want to thank a number of people, certainly everybody that's joining us here today in person, everybody who's joining us on Zoom. Uh, every, the last three years we've done this, it's 100 plus people, uh, certainly shows the, uh, the amount of uh, interest in the R3 movement here in the great state of Nebraska. Uh, how important is this? Well, you look around the room, you see one director, one deputy director, and one assistant director, a whole lot of a division administrators and staff, uh, I think, and volunteers and, and representatives from our organizations, Ducks Unlimited, Pheasants Forever, National Arctic Federation, and the list goes on and on. I'd say it's pretty darn important. And I'd say that what we're doing here today and what we're going to be doing, uh, continue doing over the next several months, several years is pretty darn important. Uh, there, there, is no, there is no fall gap. I don't know if you guys ever saw the movie. Raise, raise your hand if you saw the movie Armageddon. That's just one of my favorite movies. Isn't that a great movie when, he, when Bruce Willis realizes the world's going to end, the asteroid's going to hit, and he looks at NASA and says, you guys don't have a backup plan? Certainly you have people in an office just thinking of backup plans. And they're like, nope, you guys, you oil drillers are the best backup plan we got. Uh, we don't have a backup plan either. Uh, the people in this room, uh, the people on Zoom, and the partners and volunteers and organizations we work with across the state, that's it. So if we don't solve this issue and that decline continues to occur, that's on us. And I know I'm speaking to, uh, to the choir here because there's just as many passionate people looking back at me uh, as, as uh, I am to you. So I can't tell you how much I appreciate you being here. I want to thank the team uh, that uh, put this together. Uh, certainly Hershey on his MC skills. One other person that deserves a round of applause, and that's the individual that helped coordinate most of this, Julia Plugi, standing there in the back of the room. And so thank you, Julia. We appreciate all you did to help put this together. Uh, a lot of extra time. Didn't have to do it, but you did, and I appreciate it. Uh, and thank you all, volunteers and, and uh, friends who uh, help us all, all, all the time, every year, and staff who, uh, when we're out there working together, this is a partnership effort. There couldn't be more collaboration than there is on the R3 effort, and that is so great, greatly appreciated. And with that, Director Douglas, please. Thanks, Jeff. 
and I'm going to take a short amount of time. Uh, again, thanks to everyone, whether you're on Zoom or you're here, and thanks for all of you that are here for sticking with this whole program. I want to make sure that, you know, as you contemplate everything that you heard today and that you've seen today, and as you move forward and you get uh, the chance to look at all of these different inputs that we have, uh, remember that when I talked earlier about uh, my answer to questions posed of whether we were, working, we were working hard enough, whether we were working fast enough and so on, and I was saying no, no, uh, my message there really was we can't let up. That was my message, we can't let up. Now. Well, if you talk about working harder, everybody here is part of working very, very hard right now. And I appreciate that. And everybody that cares about this appreciates that. So don't take that in the wrong vein. But what we do know is right. Uh, we don't wanna work harder uh, at the things that aren't the most effective, right? So uh, what's that mean? The old saying, don't always work harder, work smarter. That's what this is all about. These uh, conferences like this are about working smarter. We're learning and adapting. We're learning from others who are doing things and looking at the results of what happens. So, so we're working smarter. And then also on faster. You know, it's the old, the old thing about the guy that's driving down the road really fast and, the, and the, his friend says, you know where you're going? Uh, no, but I'm making really good time. So we don't wanna make really good time going down the wrong road. So, so what we're doing is learning and adapting. And I wanna thank everybody that helped put this together and is gonna to continue to do the research, do the looking at uh, uh, what has happened and adapting to it. And we're gonna, we're gonna get this done uh, because it's a noble cause and all of you are making it happen. So thank you very much.